Hello again, friends, and you are our friends, and welcome back to another edition of Jim Cornette's drive Through right here on another very happy Monday morning. <clears throat> Despite the fact that a couple people may be cranky and tired, we're pretending that we're happy today because we have a happy review and you're a happy audience, and we're going to have a goddamn good time here. By hook or by crook, I'm your host, the great Brian Last, and of course, the star of this here drive through the biggest man in podcasting today, Mr. Jim Cornette. Hey, I'll have you know I've lost weight, and I'm only 199 pounds currently. Lost three pounds this past week worrying about things, but you, hello again, friends, and you are our friends. I don't know about you, but I don't think you should have said hello again because it doesn't feel like we've left. We just did That's the truth. a program not even... I can't even do the math. Not, but 18 hours ago, we did a program. We're back to do the other part of the program to catch up from all the technical difficulties we've had. If you don't know, out there in podcasting land, members of the Cult of Cornette, if you don't know what the technical issues were, then I advise you, encourage you, and point you toward the Jim Cornette experience that just emanated from our studios. <laughs> last night actually this morning was it last night or was it this morning did you get it up before midnight it went up before midnight of course <clears throat> well then it was last night and now it's this morning and i have in the between time and in the meantime as ed whalen would say if he didn't fuck it up like i did i've watched the event from minneapolis the other night full gear and now we, we can talk about that as well as I've had my telephone fixed. And everyone wants to talk. Don't know who you are and I'm busy. There you go. Not too rude. Well, I didn't want to take up too much of the people's time. But anyway, so here we are again. Graduates of major universities. Ready to do another program for the, the cult of Cornette Faithful. We're going to have songs. We're going to have pay-per-view reviews. We're going to have questions. We're going to have frivolity. And uh, again, if if anybody's wondering why that we sound like we don't give two flying French fried titty fucks, it's because I'm tired. All right. Well, you. Sound I'm so tired, tired of being. A All right. I did that the other day. Was that Bella Lugosi or was that Santino? I can't tell no, what that, that was. was. That was that was uh, um, Greta Garbo. No, uh, old uh, <laughs> Madeline Kahn doing the Marlene oh, Dietrich uh, that's right, that's uh, right. uh, impersonation in, well, oh, never mind. I never know with you. Your, your vocal stylings well, are so unique. I've got an extensive musical background. I went to Juilliard. You're going to ask, you, you went to Juilliard? You went to Juilliard? Really? No, this I is just news? made that shit up. I know. I'm, of course. Actually, I went to Ju Juilliard Gardening. It's down the street on Shelbyville Road. They have great potted plants. You know, as stupid as the whole Jameson thing was in WWE, the one joke that always got me was from his introduction. Remember, they broke off Bobby Heenan from primetime wrestling, which was a stupid move to begin with. Yes. To create the Bobby Heenan show. So instead of primetime being two hours, it was 90 minutes. Now it was Gorilla and Roddy Piper. You know, a studio setting like that wasn't the best place for Roddy Piper with Gorilla Monsoon. Yeah, it was a little canned, a little forced in the, you know. And then you'd get the Bobby Heenan show with the Oinkettes, with the Rosati <laughs> sisters. And his first guest that I remember was Jameson, and he introduces him as being from NASA. He works for NASA. And it turns out he doesn't work for NASA. He lives in Nassau. Nassau County. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it reminds me, Brian, actually, of you talk about Roddy. I did his podcast he was doing a year or so before he, he passed away. He had just started doing his podcast, and he had a co-host named Earl Skakel. And he introduced me to him, and it was on the phone. We weren't doing the, the Skype then, this major technology we've got now that just makes our lives so much better. We were on the phone and it wasn't the greatest connection. And he introduced me to Earl Skakel. And I thought he said he was Canadian. And well, that makes sense because Roddy's, you know, originally from Canada. So we go on and Roddy and I are saying something. And then 
somehow it came up. I said, well, Earl's a Canadian. He said, what? Where'd you hear that? I said, well, you told me that. He said, no, he said he was a comedian. I said, well, as a comedian, he makes a good Canadian. It was funnier if you were there. Roddy liked it. It was funnier if I'd told it remotely even as good as it happened. Yeah, it was funnier the first few times I heard it. Well, I said, we've got new listeners. Well, you made it sound like I did something wrong for not laughing at it. I heard it before. It's funny. All right, McMahon. The Canadian. Were you a lich? Lich. Were you a rich little fan? (laughs) Were you a lich riddle fan? By the way, some... (laughs) (laughs) Lich riddle. Somebody said, why was he, why was Cornette calling Brian last Vince McMahon when I said that on a show a couple weeks ago? Okay, McMahon, no, Ed McMahon. It's Carson and McMahon we're doing here. Um, yes, I was a rich little fan. He did a great Johnny Carson. But I, I was a rich little fan because that was pretty much the only impressionist that you saw on The Tonight Show back in those days when I was a, a young wee little fellow. Did you stay up and watch The Tonight Show when you were a little kid? Well, part of the time, it was easier because what was it? When I, well, I won't say when I was little. It was like when I was 11, 12, 13, something like that. They Something to do with the energy crisis we were having. We suddenly here in Louisville for a while got stuck on, I don't know if it was a pullback of daylight savings time or we were Eastern time or whatever, but suddenly the Tonight Show came on at 1030 at night and that happened for a while. But I would, I would, I would peek at the monologues often. I didn't, I, especially when I was a little fellow, I wasn't up all the way to the, to see who got bumped at the end. But, but then again, when I was a young man and TV was good, um, they had the best of Carson and they re syndicated, they re ran tonight shows. I remember they definitely did it when I went to visit Aunt Lola and Uncle Tommy up in uh, Covington. They had a, a they even had a Sunday night repeat of the Carson show, so you could see him. Think about Johnny's deal. Johnny had a ninety minute show. He also had the rights to that time slot, or at least they gave him you know the ability to control that time slot. Eventually, he made it sixty minutes because he decided he didn't want to work anymore. Yeah, and then he had a guest host because he decided he didn't want to work that day either. <laughs> He had the best deal ever. And then he owns all of his tapes. Well, That's why NBC now. doesn't own the Tonight Show stuff with Carson. He can't call it, or the Carson estate can't call it the Tonight Show. They call it Johnny Carson. Right. But NBC doesn't have the rights to any of it. Well, and that's it's on Antenna TV, isn't it? Uh, now it's not me TV. I think it's Antenna TV on weeknights. But uh, the they can't. But some for some copyright reason they can't play Ed McMahon's individual introduction that he would do on that show, so they just have the generic theme music, and then you they cut directly to here's Johnny. I've not figured that one out why they can't have McMahon announcing that night's guest, but you overlooked something. Maybe a music issue because usually he was doing that with the music behind him. Do they use True. the original? There you go. Music? There you well they 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 it's the theme but it's the same ones I, they're not playing it live so maybe it's the there's something there there's a loophole but you overlooked first of all he said first he had said I only want to work sixty minutes then I only want to work four days a week so he got the guest host on what was it Mondays then he only wanted to work three days a week so he had a guest host Monday and then he got multiple weeks vacation. But did you know that the original Tonight Show, when he took it over in 1962, was an hour and 45 minutes? Jack Parr. Because also many of the local TV stations only had a 15-minute 11 o'clock newscast back then. So for a, a while, he started coming out and doing a monologue that was only seen over part of the network because some of the stations at that time were going to the half an hour newscast. So the full network wouldn't join till 1130 Eastern. And when he got enough stroke, he went to him and said, you know what? I'm tired of doing a show for half the audience. So they sent, I think it was, they sent Ed McMahon out and or had the band play for the first 15 minutes of the tonight show on the air. Some places, and Johnny started coming at 1130, and then they just said, fuck it, we're an hour and a half. So that's pull, pal. 
Not only that, but, you know, he controlled the time slot after him, which was Tom Snyder and then would become David Letterman. Yes. And that's the reason why Letterman wasn't supposed to have a real band like Johnny had. I mean, it worked out great. Paul Schaefer's band ended up being iconic. He ended up, he had a better band. Yeah, it ended up being iconic, but that was the thing there. Also, that's why, I think that was one of the reasons why his desk was on the other side. It was the opposite of Johnny's. He had the clear guests with Johnny's office, and they got along great, but Johnny Carson controlled everything. Until Jay Leno and Helen Kushnick pushed him out. That bitch. And she wasn't too too good either. <laughs> anyway. All right, we just did 12 minutes on nothing. How's that? Okay, well, here's something. I've got to let the people know. This is the week, the big week, the auction at Heritage Auctions for my Wrestling All-Stars trading cards. The three sets from 82 and 83 ends this Thursday, November 18th. And uh, by the time you hear this, the reserve bids, I understand, will be have been published or recognized or whatever. So we're down to, as JR would say, nut cutting time. So if you want to get in on these legendary cards, high grade, my personal sets, held at the vault here for 40 years for just such an occasion, not in a mayonnaise jar on Funk and Wagnall's porch since noon today, go to jimcornett.com and click on the banner on the homepage about the trading cards takes you right to the listing at Heritage Auctions. There is still time to own these historic pieces of memorabilia for your very own to love, hug, and call them George. You should have some kind of stamp for things that people get from the vault that say they're from the Cornette vault. Not just a certificate of authenticity, but an actual branding a stamp well i have a feeling if i'd have stamped a stamp on these trading cards that the grading service would not have been as kind as they as they were you can't just stamp these things i don't mean on the actual item but on something on some kind of certificate you've actually gotten this it's from the vault it's been here it's been locked away no one can well i'll tell you what whoever whoever buys these cards you email me through the contact form at jimcornett.com <laughs> when i can read these hundreds of emails that i'm getting i will send you a complimentary certificate of authenticity how's that you see and you are our friends and they are our friends maybe not yours but mine that works well speaking you, of you, what you keep telling me friends are overrated anyway a friend in need is a pest you said that. Those are your words, not my words. Those are Bobby Heenan's words. Well, you have stolen so much from Heenan. Why stop now? Hey! God damn, when you tell the truth, it's sharp. All right, what are we doing here today? We are doing... That's a great question. We have to at least do the review of <laughs> AEW Full Gear. Because that's I the reason we we've woken up today and done this so <laughs> early. And then we'll see where we go from there. All righty. Well, it's your show. What would you like to know first? Did you watch the buy-in for Full Gear? Are you kidding? <laughs> the fucking trouble that I had. And you know what I heard on Twitter? Other people were saying, fuck Spectrum. And some, uh, some lady said that she's been having the same thing with her internet speed slowing down and uh, couldn't order the pay-per-view. Uh, more people chimed in that Spectrum should be disemboweled with rusty fishing knives so they're not a very popular company but no I, I as we mentioned on the experience i obtained let's say a screening copy of the pay-per-view after trying to buy it from my local cable provider and from the folks at bleacher seats and neither one would take my money Bleacher Report, and I've seen a lot of complaints about their service during the pay-per-view and, of course, afterwards where people wanted to access the replay and they couldn't for, I guess, at least 24 hours, and then they would lose access to it after 72 hours? I mean, there's something weird going on there. I don't know. Well, you know, can't trust those Bleacher's people. After, after that big best-selling book, remember Under the Bleacher's by Seymour Butts that was on all the stands? No, I don't remember that, no. Yeah, it it was it was the next best seller on the New York Times list list after uh, Golden Rivers by IP Freely. Uh, all right, well. So anyway, so I didn't see the buy in because I was lucky to well I wasn't lucky to see this thing. It took a, a a lot of effort to see the pay per view itself. I didn't see the buy in. How about the opening match on AEW Full Gear, which 
I thought was an instant classic. It was an instant. It was not an instant classic. They built it. They did, it wasn't just as easy as being instant. They did a tremendous job. MJF and Darby Allen. I'm kind of, I'm glad that they started the show with this, and in a way I'm not. I'm glad they started the show with it because they probably wouldn't have gotten as good a crowd reaction after they'd seen all the ridiculous nonsense that happened later on in the program to have a nice wrestling match. Uh, but I'm mad for personally for myself that they put it on first because it was all downhill from there. This was the best match that either MJF or Darby Allen have ever had that I've ever seen. And I, I mean, even, you know, Darby, the weird, the car wreck video, I would, it, it, for before his entrance, I would like to say certainly he didn't really do that. They hired a, a professional stunt driver from Hollywood and the safety protocols were in place. But I guarantee you that he probably really did do that and just took some camera out to the, what was that, a, a, a folded up prison, a closed up prison yard? But I'm sure they did. Yeah, I don't he know just, where he hangs out. I'm sure he just rolled his car twice and crawled out. And <sighs> the people love him, and you got to like him because when he gets in the ring and he does that stuff. But what would, <laughs> what would they have said if they'd called Tony Khan and said, hey, you know, we were filming this opening for Darby's entrance video and he's just blown himself up in the car. We can't find a body or anything. What it call sting. That's what he would say. <laughs> can sting. Can you fill in? <laughs> <clears throat> but anyway, it, besides the fact that he seems determined for whatever reason to not only to kill himself now that he's got the highest paying job of his life, um, you know, he's got that weird appeal when he, he he came in skateboarding down the ramp wearing a flasher's raincoat and it works for him. The people love him. They started with wrestling exclamation point. I couldn't believe it. right off the bat on an AEW show. They're doing wrestling spots. Then they did. I can't say it was Lucha spots. It, I've detected a little, maybe tiger mask and Mark Rocco black tiger in there. Uh, there was a little element of, the 80s New Japan junior heavyweight division with the, whether Fujinami or Tiger Mask or whatever, where they're doing innovative moves and they're doing some gymnastics, if you want to call it that, but it's in the frame and the of a contest. It's in context of a wrestling match. You have, they didn't lose sight of that. And that's, you know, it's, it, to me, this could have worked either on an NWA show in the 80s, just, you know, two guys that are really fucking athletic. It could have worked in Japan, at, like I said, at the point where they were doing innovative moves and taking bigger bumps and doing more athleticism, but still they hadn't, like they have now in Japan too, as well as here, lost sight of what the whole thing is. It, it it fit in a variety of eras, in a variety of styles or methods of wrestling because it was so good and they didn't insult the basic concept of wrestling, which is it's a struggle, it's a fight, it's a contest. And for the people who, you know, and I was one of them for a while, but I'm seeing now the, the AEW fans can react and do react to good wrestling. It's not just about the stunt show and the car wreck and the, you know, the kids playing that segment of the, you know, the, the company, they react to personalities and to good wrestling and a, a good match when they see it. And now they're starting to see it, which it makes the stuff that the Bucks and those guys do even more bleh and redundant and same all the time because these matches with the quality professionals are so different. They keep the same basic concept. We're having a wrestling match, but they work them differently, whether it's Danielson or Punk or MJF and Darby here. And there's no, that's, there's variety. You can do this type of wrestling 
for a long time and people don't get tired of it because it's not the same shit all the time. You're not beaten over the head with it. It's not self-aggrandizing physical masturbation out in front of everybody where you do everything you can and there's nothing left. And it's always the same, which we saw with the primary offenders later on in the program. So the AEW fans do like this shit. They just haven't gotten to see it until they've started importing all the more professional talent. As a, MJF brought the house down with a sucker punch on Darby. And there was the Darby hit a dive, but it, it again, that fucking cannonball is like he shot out of a cannon where MJF thought he had him, threw him in the ring, hot dogs with the people a little bit, turned around, boom, and gets wiped out. And I'm, I, he's going to kill himself one day, Darby, but <clears throat> if you're going to do that, that's the way to do it because it looks like an offensive move instead of a, you know, fucking cooperative exhibition. Um, it was exciting as hell for the people, and they took them up and down, but it didn't seem phony. There was no egregious cooperation. They they had their game faces on and the way that they went at each other. I can believe that they didn't like each other. And not only does Darby sell so much better than his level of experience, it looks like, and I'm sure in some case with the bumps he's taken, it, it's real. It looks like he's fucking dying, gasping for breath. MJF with the backbreakers and the, did you see the power bomb on the knee? Yeah, that, of course. That was a beautiful, a little variation on a move that we've seen a million times. You can only do it with Darby because he's 150 pounds. You can't do it with a 230 pound guy. You break your fucking leg, but it looked great. Um, they, there was a clear heel and a baby face. The crowd was into it. There wasn't anything illogical. Even though they took big bumps, everybody sold the shit. Um, I loved especially the way that MJF told a story all through, you know, that second half of the match. He's selling the leg. He sold the power bomb onto the knee, sold the leg. He got, Darby got a figure four on MJF's bad leg, and he's fucking flipping out. He got a big pop. Um, MJF did the tombstone on the apron, which again, it's apron shit, but that's safer than the, some of the shit they do because you're in a confined area and movement, but he sold his leg screaming and they got a pop when they both beat the count and, uh, you know, they, they, then some more wrestling, the roll-ups Darby's trying to do the quick pin. Uh, the, the double bridge that laid into the match into Darby's code red, which got a big pop. People are standing up at this point. They're the guys are not rushing. They're they've got a good pace. It ebbs and flows. The the coffin drop on with Darby on the floor. I again, I don't know what he's trying to do to himself, but he goes for another coffin drop in the ring and MJF gets the knees up and sells his leg. Boom. Perfect. And then here comes Wardlow and Spears down the ramp. And when we think this great match is going to get fucked up, here comes Sting and he's got the bat and he takes the chairs and they suddenly fought off. Brian, do you remember one of the things that we tried to record <laughs> on Saturday when we gave up? Cause we couldn't get it. Cause the Skype connection, we, I couldn't understand you. We were trying to do a preview of these matches. And this is the one I said, if, if they got to have some interference with staying and his goons, can they do it in the body of the match and get that out of the way and then continue to the finish and son of a gun. That's what they did. So and finally they had to, they had to do a little Zabada. MJF goes out and gets the skateboard and he comes in and the referee standing there, not trying to take it away from him. Just like, don't use that. And that takes us down a second because that's ridiculous and not what would actually happen. But basically he shoved it at Darby Allen to try to get Darby hit me, get disqualified. And the announcer is telling that story. 
And Darby didn't, of course, and gave it to the referee. And as the referee turns to put it out, MJF gets the diamond ring and KOs Darby. And what a fucking shot. It led he crumpled and fell into MJF, which was perfect because he grabbed a headlock on him, hit him with the headlock takeover and beat him just like he promised with a headlock takeover. One, two, three. Except Darby's shoulder was up. Uh, but they counted it anyway. Except for, did they need the business with the skateboard? Did that Does that throw the sports entertainment thing into it and everybody comes to a halt? And I if they'd it had that the, fight, the, at, well, I'm just, if they'd had that fight for the past 20 minutes at that point, if the guy shoves the skateboard at you, but he's there on his knees going, hit me, wouldn't you just bypass the skateboard and football kick him right in the face and beat him? No, because again, the whole premise of this feud is MJF isn't just trying to beat Darby. He's trying to mentally beat Darby. I know. And Darby's Jesus fighting H everything Christ. he can. And you know what? They brought that skateboard in the ring. It didn't take the fans down. That's the thing. Everything in that match, the fans are up for. And I don't know if it hurt the rest of the card. I, obviously, I don't think anything else in the rest of the card could compare to this match. No. But I had no problem with the skateboard spot because it worked within everything they've been doing and it didn't hurt the crowd. And I will ad ad admit also that everybody was into everything. So I'm not saying it ruined the match. I'm just, I don't know if I would have come out with the ring a little different way. But otherwise than that, it was fantastic. It was modern era action, but it didn't break any wrestling rules, such as don't make this shit look phony. It was both guys' best match ever. MJF even got some stooge at ringside to help him limp out afterwards to sell the thing. But again, this would have fit in a variety of places back when all wrestling was still professional and people were held to higher standards and, and guys weren't allowed to just go out and do whatever the fuck they felt like doing, whether it was silly or stupid or not. This would have worked in Crockett, would have worked in WCW in their good periods. It would have worked in the Attitude Era on WWF. It would have worked in Japan at one point because it was good wrestling with two guys working and taking the people on a ride, and it all made sense. Except, like I said, of the skateboard, I'll give, a, I'll give them the skateboard. What the fuck? It's, it's, it's the modern age. But I, otherwise than that, I mean, you know, you're right. It did... It did somewhat set a precedent that was hard for everybody else to follow. But at the same time, if they'd have put it on after that ridiculous six-man tag, then people would have been either disgusted or worn out or probably just like, when will this be over by that point? And, and I think it would have hurt the match. So I'm glad they put it on first. I thought, like I said, it was an instant classic. I was at Brett Owen at WrestleMania 10 Live in the fourth row, and I may have enjoyed this match as much as I enjoyed that match. This match is one of the greatest opening matches in the history of wrestling on pay-per-view, and you encapsulated a lot of my thoughts. You know, Darby is wacky, and I know you'll never get Darby, and I think a lot of that's just a generational thing. You didn't grow up with Jackass. True. You didn't grow up with this stuff. So I think a lot of it is just, you know, they were, they were still mules. When I <laughs> so a lot of the frames of reference that people may have, uh, cause they grew up with it. You may not have, but even with all of that and all the wackiness and these videos, which are very artistic, he seems real. I know it sounds crazy cause he yeah. seems wacky and he has half his face painted, but he seems real. Like he doesn't seem like someone you see him out of the ring and he's going to be smiling and high-fiving and a nice guy. He seems like he'll be this brooding guy everywhere you meet him and he's probably miserable most of the time <laughs> like he seems real and he's he's the he's the guy that slept in his car before the pay-per-view last year to remind himself what it was like when he had to sleep in his car i'm like that's why i was saying i guess it's a generational difference because i'm like i would be, be able to remember that i wouldn't need a refresher on that i'd be in the hotel looking out the window going yeah i remember i was sleeping in a parking lot we don't get to see MJF wrestle that much. True. And part of that may be a good thing because you don't get overexposed to him. But on the other hand, when you see stuff like this, and I start thinking about the previous MJF matches I've seen, 
especially maybe like the last year or so. Cause I think like when he first got there, he was even younger and, you know, he was working with like Cody. So, I mean, he wasn't really going to be leading anything. I would yeah. think in those situations. And then he had to dumb himself way down and slow himself way down for the matches with Jericho. Right. But when you see something like this match, I think he's as good in the ring as he is on promos. He gets the little things. He gets the reactions. He knows how to sell. He yeah. knows how to be a rule breaker. People may forget before we all just call them heels willy dilly. Rule breakers. <laughs> That's what they were yes. called. I think he's just such a tremendous talent. And, you know, I said about a year and a half ago or so. Actually, I don't even remember. Whenever the Jericho feud finally wrapped up or was getting close to wrapping up, I said, or maybe it was even before they went to it. Now that I think about it, I can't remember. Yeah, that so was much a long time happens. ago. I said they should have gone down the road of Adam Page as champion into a feud with MJF. And maybe down the road they'll go down that road, because I think MJF probably has a good uh, top-of-the-card run at some point coming. Down the road, maybe they'll go down that road. But if they stop at the Slauson cutoff, get out, cut off their Slauson, and continue on until they come to the fork in the road. Okay. We were still doing Carson and McMahon a minute ago. What happened? I'm on the Dick Cavett now. Listen. You're on the, okay. I'll what? be over here with Mervin. Do you see any Buddy Rogers in MJF? Of course. You, well, you see a little bit of everything because obviously, besides the fact that he's such a smart guy and he's a student and he's been watching this shit, past and present, modern and vintage, for as long as he's been alive, you just see that it's, it's the attitude. And it's the swagger and it's the, you know, he had more confidence here, I think, than, than we've seen him in the ring. But he's always got confidence to him in the way he carries himself as a self-absorbed dipshit. And Darby, a loss doesn't hurt him. No, not in this way at all. No. And that's that's the 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 whole issue that we've been saying is that you can win and lose in some cases. In in many cases, if you do it right and everybody comes out looking better, it's just some of these just oh, let's trade wins. You win this week, I'll win next week when there's willy-nilly no long-term thought behind who actually does come out the winner. That's when it hurts. You know, we talk about the crowd. Obviously, we weren't there, and you always hear from people who are in the room who say that the crowd is a lot louder and more into things than you realize. I thought, and maybe I'm completely wrong, because I was watching it on my TV, streaming it off Bleacher Report, I actually thought the finish of the next match and everything leading up to the finish with the mask may have been something that it sounded like here at my house was killing off the crowd. Well, I heard this pay-per-view better than any other AEW pay-per-view that I've watched because I was sitting here at my computer listening on the headset. And that gives you better audio than watching on TV, even though I've got the surround sound, the speakers, or whatever, because it's blocked everything else out. And I can hear, I can hear some guys calling spots. They probably need to have a talk about some of that. But you can hear a lot more of the oomphs and ahs. I actually heard the commentary, unfortunately. There was nothing that I could really do about it. But you do hear the crowd better, and you could tell the places where they were really lit up and really hot. And you could also tell the places where they were like, oh, no, all right, checking their watches. There was an element of that in the Minneapolis street fight, checking their watches, how much more of this can happen. But it really the, yeah, the, the start of the downhill slide was, I didn't like FTR's match. I'll say that right off the bat. It wasn't their fault. We'll get into it. But the finish of that match, was just fucking right. I actually wrote down, is this sabotage? Which is the way that we down in Kentucky say sabotage. 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 You say sabotage. I say sabotage. We say sabotage. You say sabotage. But they're being sabotaged. There is no way, whether you like the Lucha Brothers or not, if you like the Lucha Brothers, you like this match. If you don't, which I have seen FTR against as many luchadors as I want to see. It's a complete opposite style from theirs, and it's not doing them any good at all. But the, the finish of that match was ludicrous, and whoever called for it 
whoever laid it out, whoever was there a walkthrough that somebody could see how rotten this was going to turn out in advance and made them do it anyway? Um, I don't have an answer for that. So you want to get into the tag match? Let's get into the tag match. Let's get into the tag match. We saw, we saw FTR have the the match with who was it samurai del soul and oh god what, oh, what was, was the other guy's uh, name his name is the name of a vehicle a vehicle Super, a minivan no, um, a- aerostar aerostar is that a minivan i think it is oh. anyway it was rotten because ftr had to stand there and wait for them to get their shit together to do all of their contrived gymnastics the lucha brothers are a little bit better at the contrived gymnastics but FTR are sharp, precise. They have perfect basics. Their excellence of execution, everything they do is perfectly timed and and beautiful to watch. And the Lucha Brothers are all over the place. It's either the gymnastics or the Lucha stuff with no basics whatsoever. Complete opposite team of FTR, and as a result, you can't get a real FTR match out of these guys. But it's better than the Lucha Brothers against anybody else because at least FTR's in there trying. And they also used the corpse referee, Rick Knox, so they had no help at all in trying to make this a wrestling match. Um, it took it it got better when FTR would take over and control the pace a little bit. <clears throat> and at one point they they stopped Felix, and I thought they were gonna get the heat on him, but he just quickly just tagged out. So FTR made it a hot tag through no fault to the Lucha Brothers because as the guy was just wandering, leaning over, flat-footed, reaching out, Dash makes a run and throws a drop kick and misses it and bounces off the top rope, and then the guy tags. So that made it a hot tag. But the actual tag was bleh. And the Lucha Brothers made a comeback with a forever four-way that they do when the referee stands there like a dumb shit and everybody forgets that they're supposed to be tagging. And after they made the big comeback, they just started a match again. And the Lucha Brothers got the contrived double hold while the referee stood there dumbfounded. And then did you see the part where our friend Penthouse backed Dax Harwood up in the corner, went up for the 10 punches, and hit the buckle and the pad, and air, and his own forearm, (laughs) and never touched Dax's head. Well, he might have on the first one, because the camera angle wasn't really conducive to seeing for sure, but when they got the close-up, the, it, eight times, it wouldn't have fooled the general admission section, and the announcers went deathly silent which I can tell you from experience is when you're sitting there looking at the monitor going, I can't say anything. Then they stopped penthouse for another set of heat. And honestly, these guys don't deserve two comebacks in the same match. And they tied penthouse's mask to the ropes and double boomeranged his head into the ropes and tore the mask free. And um, there was a, a false tag where penthouse tagged Felix And the distraction was timed fairly perfectly by FTR, and the referee actually did his job. I couldn't believe it. But then Penthouse drops both members of FTR and gives a cold tag to Felix. Nobody was even close to stopping him. And Felix did all his shit. FTR feeds great for this stuff. I will admit, that was a snazzy tightrope walk into a kick on the top rope by old Felix. But there was lots of misdirection. Felix ran into a belt shot. Dax hit a brain buster two count. That would have been a great fucking finish if FTR was going over, which I would have hoped still at this point that they were, that somebody was going to figure this out. So that would have been a great finish, but it wasn't. Um, More false finishes. Tully actually pulled a leg. Nothing happened, but he pulled one of the guy's legs. They did a good spot where Dax went for the three amigos and the people booed, but Penthouse stopped him before he got there, and then Penthouse did it, 
and got a big pop, and then Felix came off with a frog splash and got a two count. That would have been a great finish. If the Lucha Brothers were going to win, the place would have come unglued. Then there was more stuff that you couldn't keep track of, and Felix kicked out of the spike pile driver. Which is another reason I was thinking, oh God, if they don't win, if FTR doesn't win now, what the fuck? More tags by the baby faces, because now they've lost complete semblance of where the fuck they are and they're just doing shit back and forth. And it's Felix cross bodied Cash off of Dax's ass while Penthouse had Dax up in a package pile driver, which he then gave him. He got a two count. What a finish that would have been. The people were loving this because they like this fucking car wreck bullshit, but it was the first time that I can ever remember I was waiting for the end of an FTR match. And then that's when they did it. Suddenly, both members of FTR roll out of the ring and go underneath the ring. And whereas Dax had been legal, apparently, now Cash comes back out, but they've Cash came back out with the green frog mask on where they impersonated a tag team a few weeks ago, right? And the announcers say, well, he's not the legal man. They've switched. All the momentum came to a halt, basically. The Lucha Brothers gave their finish to the illegal man and pinned him flat in the middle of the ring. Without Dax ever coming out from underneath the ring to show that he was wearing a mask too, when he came out, I saw him pulling it off because the one, two, three had already happened. I, I don't know what the fuck is going on, and I don't know. What, again, did they walk through it? Who forced this finish on them? It was horrible. Why did Dax stay under the ring? Why why did they do this at this moment anyway? They each had done two or each team, two or three big moves that would have been a spectacular finish for either team to win this thing and the place would have exploded. But they stopped everything to do this bullshit that wasn't well done. They beat FTR flat in the middle of the ring while they made them look stupid at the same time. It's sabotage. You can't tell me different. You're, is somebody going to tell me that FTR on a big pay-per-view match said, this is the finish we're going to do. They'll remember this one for 20 years. Fuck. Who is fucking these guys? Horrible finish. Not just because it, was a horrible finish, but it didn't even make sense. Like you said, we never see <laughs> Dax. I mean, the whole thing was stupid and poorly conceived. But when you think about FTR's booking, and we've had a little bit of a run where they've been booked fairly well. But think about the Young Bucks match. Because I started thinking about it after the finish of this, because I was like, oh my God, I can't believe the Lucha Brothers just beat them. And I like the Lucha Brothers a lot more than you. And I still can't believe they beat them. And I think back I to the can, Young Bucks. I, can, I could believe, I would even accept that they'd beaten them if they'd beaten them with a wrestling finish that they did in the match and got big pops instead of this stuff to make them look stupid and beat them flat in the middle at the same time. That's the thing. It's the second big match where they had a stupid finish because the idea that FTR would decide at that point to go switch Killer B style under the ring in the masks yeah. makes no sense. The Young Bucks match. What was FTR's big slogan for years? No flips, just fists. Right. How do they lose that match? Cash does a giant flip off the rope <laughs> and gets pinned. And I'm like, okay, you know, not the finish I would do because I would have had FTR win, but clearly that sets up match two. They could talk about, we went away from our game plan. We did a flip. We shouldn't have. No, it was never brought up ever again. <laughs> and now they did the stupid thing here with the masks. Bad booking of FTR, who were so talented in the ring. Just ask the guys in that company what it's like to work with Dex. So I don't understand what they're doing. I really don't. I, I'm, again, I, if, if somebody can present me evidence to the contrary, and I will be more than happy to admit that I was wrong, but I, you can't tell me that FTR either came up with that finish or 
wanted to fucking do it once they heard it. And you can't tell me that anybody thought that that was a good idea that would make them look better in losing as Darby did in the, in the previous match or not look. Basically, you can't convince me that somebody didn't do that with the idea of making them look completely like shit and killing the finish of that match. It's not who won. It's how it was done. And that's another thing. And a lot of people don't understand this. You said the booking of FTR lately has been, well, you can book somebody to go over every night and still make them look like a complete idiot if that's your goal and you really want to do it. So winning or losing or whether they've had a belt or they've been on TV or whatever, if you want to make somebody look like an idiot or somebody wants to make somebody look like an idiot, you can do it. That's all I'm saying. And, you know, another thing, if you want to do something with FTR, if somehow this is all part of a grand plan where they keep losing big matches by doing stupid things, let the revamp start with a new manager. No disrespect to Tully. Tully's slow. He gets no heat at ringside. FTR needs someone with energy. He's not allowed to do anything. And for everyone saying I'm saying Jim Cornette, I'm not. They need no. someone who can actually work ringside and get hey, some and I'm, heat. I'm only, I'm only 10 years younger than Tully, too. So <laughs> Yeah. No, but, I mean... It, you are correct, sir. This is a, the youth movement of modern era wrestling in AEW. The average age of their managers is is in their 60s. Right? Who uh, are the managers? Well, Tully, obviously. Tully. Probably closer Arn. to 70, right? T well, I'm just saying T Tully, Arn. Vicky. Vicky, Jake, Jake, maybe or maybe not. He, you know, know. With his health, whatever. Um, Alex Abrahantes ain't no spring chicken, as my aunt Lola would say. Let's say mid forties, probably. Okay. Mark Sterling's probably thirties. Well, is he a manager? Is he an attorney? Or is he just a? Oh, now you're playing the semantics. Is he, is he something? In the way? He's something in the way. <laughs> he's he's just something in the way. But poor Matt Hardy. Matt Hardy. 50 something, right? Gotta be. So <laughs> there's a bunch of young Callus. guys and a bunch of managers about to fuck him. Callus, who's fairly close to my age. He's in his 50s. So the managers are about to turn to powder. And, uh, you know, but anyway. This is when you tell Fred Blassie to stay home and you bring in Slick. <laughs> I don't know if we need to go that far. Oh, Slick was good. You didn't like Slick? Oh, Slick was all right. The but idea they brought in a character to play a pimp to manage Nikolai Volkov and the Iron Sheik that he took over the contracts from Fred Blassie. And then you got the ridiculous moments of the interaction. Come here. Come here, Slick. My friend Slick. Yeah, your friend Slick. Where are you and Slick hanging out, Freddy? Hey, Freddy was a ladies' man. So oh, maybe well. Slick would said it. Freddy was a ladies' man. That's very true. but. Slick, the only pimp in the world who was actually a preacher in real life. Well, not while he was pimping. I think it was after he retired from the street. Well, you know what they say, pimping ain't preaching. It was hard to be a pimp when you lost a warlord. Can you imagine you're walking around and that's your muscle? <laughs> well, where are we going from here? Some may say that FTR finish would drive some to drink. Some may say that. And as a matter of fact, after I watched that match, I was thinking to myself, I can't wait for my monthly delivery of WSJ wine. Folks, we've been talking about them here on the program. The Our fine friends at WSJ wine, they are your key to holiday preparation. You got a dinner party to attend. You need a hostess gift. With WSJ wine, you are never empty-handed. And I know we've got a lot of winos out there in the cult of Cornet that would like a good quality bottle of wine. If you want to keep your wine rack stocked with new and interesting wines, WSJ Wine from the Wall Street Journal is the best way to find your new favorite wines from all over the globe. They curate these wines, as they say. You can get direct access to the small batch handcrafted wines that you need to try this holiday season. If you're going to have your family, if you're going to have your, your in-laws, your neighbors and your friends in your house, you got to be sloshed, folks. You got to be pickled. 
you got to be drunk off your ass so that you don't go crazy and start gouging your relative's eyes out. So, WSJ Wines presents the Holiday Top 12, the most wonderful wines of the year, and you can uncork all of them and save $125. Each wine includes tasting notes and food pairing tips. Rate your wines, refine your selections. You can even speak to a personal wine advisor so they can customize your next case. It's a 100% satisfaction guarantee. If you don't get drunk off your ass on every bottle of wine in this case, or at least if you don't love it, you'll receive a refund. And you can receive a new dozen from WSJ Wine's most talented winemakers every three months at about a bottle a week. You can enjoy at your own pace at about a bottle of, in an evening. You can get cirrhosis of the liver. But there's no Let's obligation not recommend to continue. That. Let's not no, recommend that. No, we don't that. want to don't do a bottle in the evening. No obligation to continue or even to live no. after you have. <laughs> you have no obligation. You can do whatever you want. They offer the flexibility to delay delivery, skip a case, cancel any time. You can do whatever you want with this stuff. Folks. All you got to do to try the WSJ Wine Holiday Top 12 and enjoy two bonus bottles and two wine glasses for $69.99 plus tax and shipping. My God, Seth, that's good heavens. That's pennies a bottle. This is this is better than Ripple. Uh, this is a better deal than, do you know what Ripple and, and Champagne put together is, don't you? What's that? Champipple. You know when you put eggnog and ripple together, you know what you get? No. Egg nipple. Well, folks, right now, 14 bottles of wine, two wine glasses, $69.99 plus tax and shipping if you text Jim, J-I-M, to 64,000. That's Jim to 64,000. All you got to do is text Jim to 64,000 and get 14 bottles of wine, two wine glasses, $69.99 plus tax and shipping, and... Holy mackerel, you'll be seeing sunshine, lollipops, rainbows, and waterfalls this holiday season when you're annoying families in the house because you'll be out in the backyard south to the gills. Terms apply. Available <laughs> at wsjwine.com slash terms. A wonderful gift, by the way. We just got a WSJ wine package for a couple of our friends for a couple of different things, and they're over the moon about it. Great gift. They're over the moon. Well, one of them's under the porch. <laughs> the other one's over the moon. Well, maybe, maybe. But uh, a great deal to get soused for your holidays, folks. WSJWine.com slash terms. No, that's where the terms are. That's where the terms are. Yes. WSJWine.com is the website, but text Jim to 64,000. That's right. And you'll, get, and you'll get that deal. Pennies on pennies per bottle. A lot of pennies, but pennies. Well, sounds like maybe you've already started drinking here on the show. What was next on Full Gear? Well, the next match deserves from me an apology because I have to apologize to someone in this match because of all the bad things that I've said about him. Of course, those bad things were precipitated by the fact that he was acting like a complete fucking idiot. However, Miro, who could have thought this? Where have you been all my life, you big beast, you? What the <laughs> I am so verklempt over this, uh, so bumfuzzled. They had this guy all along, and I know he's been doing this for several weeks now or a few months or whatever, Miro the Redeemer and the, the promos and the whole nine yards, but still, this was a guy that came in, bleach blonde, wearing a pink Minnie Mouse t-shirt and loafers, as the best man at a wedding of a 12-year-old to Penelope Pit Stop, and they were playing with broken video games and mad about their fucking score being unplugged or whatever. And we raked this goofball over the coals, and it didn't help that he tried to joust on Twitter, and English being his second language, he made that statement about, I will come all over you like God's wrath. He was here all along, and they just now figured this out. Did he? It was was this him in the WWE? And I just never no. saw it. No, this was this is better than what he was in WWE. And remember when he came over, I said, 
I have some hopes for this guy because he's a guy that has shown potential, shown intensity, shown work rate, and they've done nothing with maybe this is his chance. And then he came out wearing a Minnie Mouse shirt or Mickey Mouse, <laughs> excuse me. Let me get that straight. It was pink, but I believe I it, was, it was in fact, Minnie. I thought it was Minnie. I thought it was Minnie. I think it was Mickey, although it was a pink shirt. That's what would throw you off. If it had polka dots, it would be more clear in our memories. Right. But that was what we got. And what they have turned him into, and none of this will ever forgive. He may be the redeemer now. Nothing redeems what he did with Kip Sabian at all. <laughs> but he is now, I think, better and more interesting than he ever was in WWE. One, one of their best heels here. And this match, Brian Danielson against Miro. Um, th This again, this match would have worked in the Attitude Era on Raw or on a pay-per-view back when... A large number of people actually watch this shit it wouldn't have been out of place it wouldn't have been out of place on a high quality wcw pro it wouldn't have been out of place in ring of honor it wouldn't have been out of place in any wrestling promotion over the last 25 years because it was stiff and exciting and danielson really he fought and laid it in from underneath because there was a sense of desperation and urgency at the start because you got a powerhouse against a technician. And Danielson was projecting that he was wary of Miro as an opponent. Imagine that. And they took some big bumps again, but they were selling. Brian Danielson, obviously, I think, was leading the pace of this thing because it seemed like something that a really experienced guy would be, would do. Um, Miro had a great heel attitude. Danielson sold his ass off. They didn't go hundred miles an hour. There was no joking. There was no silly. They were serious. The work was believable. The match made sense. The, at one point, Danielson fired up and made a comeback with those running drop kicks. And then he charged and Miro caught him on the fly and hit a beautiful Samoan drop. Nice and smooth. They picked up the pace. I, I wrote Miro is better than anyone could have ever known based on everything else he's ever done. Danielson brought him up with the stomps to the face. And yes, yes, yes. But then Miro power bombs him. Miro goes for the camel clutch. Danielson fought out it, fought it, but Miro got it and the people were into it and they popped on a rope break. These are people, again, what I mentioned in, MJF and Darby Allen, these are people that see these fucking vicious, awful, supposed assassination type blows and concertos and the furniture and the table breaking and the dives into numerous people, but they pop on a rope break when they care about who's involved. And then uh, uh, Miro got uh, fucking uh, booed for. The uh, the eye poke or the eye gouge, rather, when Danielson had, had countered another camel clutch and got the label lock and Miro just goes in gouging his eyes and people are like, oh, shit, he's gouging his eyes. They'll still go for it if they care about who's involved. And, the, you know, Miro was toying with him at some, the, the kick, like, you can't hurt me. This is the way you should stand there and say, go ahead, motherfucker, hit me a big heel and a beat up smaller baby face and the baby face trying the kicks and he's laughing them off. And then he'll drop Danielson with a stiff one. And then finally the, the only thing that I didn't like about this match again was the finish because they go up to the turnbuckles and they're fighting and jockeying for position and everything. But Danielson hits a DDT off the top, kind of, because how do you really do that? And it wasn't, it wasn't as smoothly or sharply executed as everything else they had done, but it, boom, he does that. And then he front face locks Miro and the referee rings the bell because he's out all the shit. And I know they're telling the story of the bad neck that Miro has or the weak neck, but all the shit they did that was brilliant. And the sloppiest looking thing was the finish. But it was a great match, and they tried, and they were they they worked, and they were stiff, and they were serious. And it, it, since I took the piss out of one thing, I will suggest an alternative. 
you can't mean to tell me that Brian Danielson can't figure out a different way to do a DDT after the the big guy fucking maybe misses something and hits his head or lands on his neck anyway than off the top rope. It, we've established the guy's got a neck of sand or whatever, but otherwise than going up there and doing that, this thing was great. What'd you think? I really liked it. I've liked Danielson and AEW, minus some of the matches where it just becomes too much back and forth. I could slug you, you could slug me. I think this was good, and I think a large part of it was Miro. Miro... I think it was on commentary here, and we could talk about the commentary later, because what a fucking disaster. But I think it was here where Jim Ross said, referencing Bill Watts, you know, something that Bill Watts used to say, look at his eyes. Yeah. You believe Miro. He says wacky fucking shit in those promos, but you believe him. You believe that he believes it. And he's a great monster. He's trying to think, who, who's a better monster heel in AEW? He may be the best one. I yeah. mean, Hobbs has a potential for down the line, but... Where, where'd Hobbs go? <laughs> oh, they're trying to sign Dante to Team Taz. Well, but I mean, he hadn't wrestled in a month or whatever since, didn't he? Uh, he was in the tournament. What happened? He lost in the tournament, and... That's right. That's been it. But that's Miro's it. fantastic. The only question I would have for you, this played out in the Fuego del Sol series of matches, and here... The whole idea he has a bad neck, he's susceptible to the DDT, specifically one off the ropes. Do you just keep this going forever? Do you come up with some kind of gimmick where now his neck is okay? What do you do with this? Well, I love the idea that the monster has a weakness, and he's incorporated into his promos well, and you can do things with it if you don't overdo it. If, you know, some fucking underneath preliminary job guy gives him a DDT. It sh well, he it shouldn't even be able to execute a DDT on him, for one thing. It should be a weakness that only the main event guys have the skill and knowledge and power and whatever to capitalize on. You can't just go out there and have... Who was it that gave him the... He was in the, with a minute jobber who was still getting offense because he dropped him on his head once. That was Fuego Del Sol. That, okay, I'm so, I was thinking of Samurai Del... What's all the Del Souls? The Del Sol family is suddenly taking over wrestling. There's, there's more of them than there is the Welches, the Fullers, or the Von Erichs. But, yes, you should... You know, he should have a weakness that the main event guys can capitalize on because that does... It gives an element of hope to the baby face that's having the shit kicked out of him if he can just land that one thing in that one way then it, you'd turn it around so i don't have a problem with that i just don't think that everybody in the world ought to be able to capitalize on it um having said where do you go with that does it get better does it stay bad <laughs> you know <laughs> the fucking this would be too much comedy and i'm i hesitate to say it because I'm afraid they might do it. But in a normal wrestling promotion from years ago where everything wasn't played for laughs and comedy and a ridiculous picture, if, and especially if the guy had a manager that could say it, but if he came out with a goddamn neck collar on that was made of some hard, sturdy material and, and nobody could fucking not only hurt his neck now, but he could use it neck butting people. I don't, but at the same time, I can see the big fucker trying to turn his head in that. And, and he'd be walking like Robbie the robot. Uh, so no, that wouldn't be a thing to do. But who knows? Maybe he meets a talented surgeon like Dr. Henry Frankenstein. Um, and he fixes the neck. I don't know. But they, again... If if Mike Tyson was susceptible to a right cross after he threw a left jab or whatever, he still wouldn't be afraid of fucking Little Orphan Annie throwing the jab or the cross. It has to be a main event guy for the weakness. That's my thought. All right. What was the next match on this show? Well, I'll give you a clue, Brian. What happens... When a bunch of smart-ass, self-indulgent juvenile delinquents are allowed to play uh, uh, with reckless abandon with their friends, unsupervised by adults, and there's nobody to spank their ass and send them to their room. 
What happens? What happened? They meet a billionaire, and he makes all their dreams come true. Well, no, in this case, you just get a Falls Count Anywhere match with Christian Cage, Jungle Boy, and Dino Douche against the Hardly Boys and Adam Cole with their friends, Michael Knock it, Knock it, Knock it to fuck off, and Brandon Cutlet, that bland, boring piece of white meat. And I went over this in my mind, even though I was short on time and energy and uh, after the efforts to watch this show, it's Adam Cole, and I respect Christian Cage. But I think I said this a week or two ago when I skipped the last Adam Cole match. I'm hoping that Kyle O'Reilly comes in. Bobby Fish is already there. What happens with Roderick Strong? We can get a reunited, undisputed era that Adam Cole can get away from these children and these bad influences. And before I know whether that's going to happen or not, I don't want to watch any more of these matches that I have to because I will end up, by the time that that actually happens, if it does, I will hate Adam Cole and not want to see him at all. So I'm going to try to give him the benefit of the doubt that this is a phase he's going through. You know, he's one of my children. All your kids, sometimes they go through a phase. They hang out with the wrong crowd. I'm going to give him some tough love. I'm not going to watch this. I don't want to knock him just yet. If it goes on continually, I will, I will turn against him with wrath and furious vengeance. But right now, I'm trying to let him get it out of his system. And it's not like that I couldn't tell. Again, like I said with Pockets, I can't come up with any new jokes to knock these guys until they come up with some new jokes to do in their matches because it's the same thing. And I, I think on the preview that we tried to record, we got just about this far, and I said it's going to be what you expect. No rules, no logic, no believability, a bunch of weapons and tables and furniture and Ill, endless you know, trampoline spots and et cetera. And of course, you know, they're going to have their referee, the 60 something year old reanimated corpse in charge of this. And so I, I didn't have an on-screen fast forward. So I was trying to go through to find the end. And every time I would stop, there it was ladders, chairs, tables, furniture, weapons, Somebody got thrown off the stage. Dino Douche had to do a backflip off the stage again. And, I mean, if you did you watch it or pay any attention to it? Is there anything I missed that was different than any of these other matches that these guys have? Probably not. This wasn't for me. That's the nicest thing I can say. Well, there you go. Then we'll skip ahead. Um, because the next match, one of the participants was not for anyone. Malachi Black and Andre Oliolio against Cody and Pac. And the, I'm, they've interconnected all these people to where, yes, it does make sense based on what they've done on television that these reluctant partners would be on each team and et cetera. It's just it it wasn't really great booking. It 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 makes sense that they did something to lead up to this. This didn't just drop in out of nowhere, but it still doesn't make any sense. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Um, to me, Malachi Black coexisting with a tag team partner and his tag team partner's stooge assistant that he doesn't really like makes him, to me, a little less spooky. Doesn't it to you? I wouldn't have him aligned with anyone, but that's just me. That's that's what I'm saying. You've not only got him aligned with another heel who is an independent person with his own stooge, but they're reluctant partners. Well, if they're reluctant partners, it, it, like you said, Malachi Black needs to be on his own and or have someone totally subservient to him involved with him if that if they need somebody. And this whole match was both teams would force tags on the other one because they didn't want to be working together but they would keep forcing back slap tags which as we all know aren't legal anyway and every time they do a slap on the back the referee go okay tag no no it's not 
It's not. It's not a legal tag. And it's not that hard if somebody's back is turned to slap their hand instead of their shoulder. All they have to do is reach out and lean on the top rope while they're looking at somebody, bam, or whatever. You can still do the same thing they were doing, but you could actually do it where it's by the rules and would make some sense in the context. But instead, they're just making themselves look like they don't know what the rules are because they don't, and the referees look like idiots because they don't know what the rules are, and that's their only job. So it got old real quick when they kept doing that. The only person in the match, think about this now, Malachi Black, picture him in your mind. Andre Oliolio with his assistant, picture them. Pac, the dirty bastard. The only person in the match who doesn't look like a stone cold heel is Cody Rhodes, and he's the only one that they're booing. They love the heels, they hate the baby face. Should we explain now why that there's should be no such thing called a Cody cutter? <laughs> I'd like to hear this. Yes. Okay. And there should be no such thing as a cutter period. Besides if it's done by diamond Dallas page, because that's not the, the, the name of that move doesn't make any sense unless it's linked with Diamond Dallas Page because Diamond Dallas Page is diamond, the diamond sign. Everybody, what do you do to diamonds? You cut them, but they're the hardest surface, as, you know, on, on earth or substance or whatever. So the diamond cutter as a move being done by a guy with a theme and a nickname and a personality surrounding diamonds makes sense. But if you don't have anything to do with diamonds, why is it a cutter? That's not just for Cody. That's for anybody. Come up with your own fucking name if you're going to steal somebody else's move. Orton did. RKO, out of nowhere. Not, oh my God, there's the Randy cutter. Anyway, um, Malachi and Andre went to the floor and huddled up and waited for Pac to do another one of his dives. Triple A beat up Jose, the assistant, which was the biggest crowd reaction of this match, except for booing Cody every time they got the chance. But after Arn fired him up, the match started back and put the crowd to sleep. And that's what you mentioned. Not only <sighs> MJF and Darby tear the house down, the Lucha Brothers and FTR were tearing the house down because this crowd does like that Lucha Brothers stuff, but their finish ruined that. And then they were followed by a good, solid single wrestling match that the people were into because it was Brian Danielson. But then they saw every self-indulgent masturbatory fantasy that those other fucking goofs could come up with for half an hour. So now they're trying to watch these guys have a tag team match where they don't like one of the baby faces and they're not particularly receptive to the whole match. And after Arn lit them up, they started back and they went back down again. And everybody in this match is good at something, but none of them are good at everything. Some guy's work is good, but his psychology sucks. Some guy's psychology is good, but his work sucks. Some guys, like Pac, you flip a switch on and off. He looks like a world beater, and he looks like a wrestling school student. There was a spot in this match, and you can't tell me now that Cody is not trying to, to turn heel on purpose because he can't be this stupid. He did this on purpose. They beat up Pac in the ring forever while Cody was selling on the floor, but his selling on the floor included standing around, leaning on the rail, kneeling by the stairs, talking to Doc Sampson, kneeling in the corner on the floor, but in the corner watching the match. He's not there when Pac gets to the corner to tag. And he walks around a little while, and finally he comes back to the corner. And when he comes back to the corner and starts working the tag, the house fucking came down with booze. It's the only time I've ever seen a babyface return to the corner after milking a potential injury to try to take the tag and the people booed but I've only been watching wrestling for 50 years. They did a simultaneous double cold tag, and Cody's comeback was accompanied by a cacophony of catcalls. The more he did, the more they booed. Cody got a figure four, 
and his own partner, Pac, while Cody's in charge, leans over and, and force tags Cody. But it wasn't legal either because he, he's so short he had to stand up on the bottom rope and lean over the top to slap Cody. And if you're obviously, as everyone knows except the people in this match, if your feet aren't on the apron, if they're on the rope, the tag doesn't count. But the referee said tag and allowed it. Then while Cody's got the figure four on the guy, Pac comes off the top with a splash on him. Boom. And Pac goes to do a dive out of the ring, but Black pulls Cody into it and Pac wipes Cody out. And then Black German suplexes. Pac gets a two count. Cody makes the save. They booed the baby face making the save. I've and finally at this point, Pac pretty much leveled Andre or whatever, went to the top. And again, and they've got a close-up on him at least, so you can't see the opponent laying there motionless stock still forever. They've got a close-up on Pac, but he goes to the top rope. He almost again loses his balance like he does almost every time he goes up there, takes forever, and then hits the splash off the top, one, two, three. That was the most blasé, they don't build anything to a big climactic point because they can't just do what they can do flawlessly and seamlessly every time. They have to go for a degree of difficulty of 10 and then do an execution of five. And I said this on the experience yesterday, and I'll say it again. Pack his physique and his groundwork, his mat work, his physical work in the ring looks great. His psychology is caca. And every time he tries to do these dives or go to the top rope or whatever, he's got a real man's body. He doesn't have to do the dives. But every time he starts doing that shit, it comes off either contrived or dodgy or whatever. There's always something he's doing. You think this is one of the greatest wrestlers in the world. And three minutes later, well, I'd kick this guy to wrestling school. It's the same fucking guy. I can't figure it out. So anyway, there's a one, two, three kind of bleh. There it was, like the turd floating in the punch bowl. And then explain this to me. Cash, without Dax, runs in and jumps on Pac and windmills him a time or two. And Tully's there and they get a couple of shots on Cody and they run right back out. And there was no Dax to be seen. This was rotten from top to bottom, from the bizarro world mirror image reactions of if you, it, it literally, if you had a match and said, okay, this is the reaction that I desire. Now, what would be the exact opposite of this? <laughs> That's what they got. And it, from top to bottom, it was not very good. What'd you think? Not very good. <laughs> I think Cody's now going to become a complete distraction for anything he's a part of. Unless they embrace the way the fans are telling them to. And I thought the whole idea of AEW that was different than WWE was they were going to listen to the fans. The fans are telling you what they think of Cody. And you're still force-feeding him a certain way. You kept saying, and then the fans booed the babyface. You know, that's something you said throughout that review. Tell me why he's a babyface. Is he a babyface? Well, he's on that side. On what side? He's 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 in that that position. He's just not acting like it. I think they've got a big Cody problem. And but you know, but uh, now here's the thing. I'm t this any wrestling, any experienced wrestling veteran of any kind, wrestler, manager, referee, promoter, announcer, whatever, would realize that when Cody stayed down there for so long off the apron, but still obviously ambulatory, just kind of selling like he's dizzy or whatever, letting Pac get the shit kicked out of him and not being there when Pac got to the corner for the tag. You're, tr you're trying to plant seeds to for a heel turn. Yeah. But he's, so he's saying, he's coming out and saying, I'm not going to turn heel, but that's a seed. And there was miscommunication between them when Pac hit the fucking dive or whatever. The point is, is he now swearing he's not going to turn heel and starting the heel turn 
so that he can be a liar and get more heat at the end of it. I don't know, but this is very bizarre shit we're looking at here. Also rotten. And not very good, of course. Let's not leave that out. But of course, Jim, if you didn't like what you saw, you probably really hated what you heard. But at least there was an option to listen to something else while watching AEW. You know, that's right, because you mentioned, and we'll talk some about the uh, the announcing and excrements attempts at same and Tony Schiavone just being happy to be there. But if you don't want to listen to the announcing and or the guys calling loud spots, you can watch these AEW programs on your screen and you can program your own audio soundtrack with a big old pair of Raycon wireless earbuds. Folks, you know, for the past few years, we've been talking about the Raycons and how quality they are and how wonderful they make your life when you can shut out the outside world. You don't have to listen to nagging better halves. You don't have to listen to lawnmowers going on at the next door neighbors. You don't have to listen to the the sound of the horn on that oncoming train bearing down on you. You can be lost in your own world with the seamless Bluetooth pairing and the comfortable noise isolating fit of the Raycon everyday earbuds. They come with three new sound profiles to make sure that everything you're listening to sounds its best with just the right amount of bass. You got the pure mode. You got the balanced mode. You got the bass mode. And they offer eight hours of playtime and a 32-hour battery life. Nothing lasts 32 hours on batteries. For heaven's sake, it, it, it just doesn't happen. Those battery-powered cars, the vibrators from Spencer's Gifts, nothing. But the Raycon wireless earbuds do. Not even the Diddleator Mach 3 lasts 32 hours on battery. But with the Raycon, there's also a built-in mic. You can take calls on your earbuds at the press of a button. And at another press of a button, you can tell them all to fuck off and leave you alone. So this holiday season, get them something they can use for phone calls, for music, for work, or for play, at home or on the go, or even on the go-go. Or just get a pair for yourself, or a pair and a spare. You're going to use them every day. And right now, go to Buy Raycon. That's B-U-Y-R-A-Y-C-O-N dot com. Buy Raycon dot com slash J-C-E. You're going to unlock exclusive deals up to 20% off your Raycon order. But hurry, it's available for a limited time only. Only for the Cult of Cornet members because they know you're cool people. Buy Raycon.com slash J-C-E to unlock up to 20% off your Raycons. Well, let's talk about the commentary. What were your thoughts on what I thought was one of the worst nights of wrestling commentary I've ever heard? And I'm not going to blame Excalibur for any of it. Well, I, I, I always blame him because he's so easy to blame. But also, I mean, Tony's losing his voice. Or maybe it was later on in the program, by the time he brought Jay Lethal out, he was sounding squeaky. And and I know, especially in a loud building, that's where I've had problems with my voice. So I sympathize with him there. Um, JR was, well, I'm sure, distracted because of his health issues that he's had and talked about with the skin cancer, I guess now in more than one place, he's got it on his back and his, his ankle, but it just, it, I don't think these three particular people work match well together or have a flow. I've I'm, I'm, you know, you've got three play by play guys and no color guy. And I mean, you know, like I said, Tony's just happy to be there. JR is distracted and excrement tries too hard. But uh, I mean, what were your thoughts? I think that Jim Ross had the worst night I think I've ever heard him have on commentary. And it sounded like he was aware of it, too. Yeah, he he didn't have he didn't have his normal energy. And he could even on the, the good wrestling matches, he wasn't. He wasn't kicking it in as often as he did. And and he got stuck on calling, which I do too. I can't, I just call him Brian now because that works either way. But is it Brian Danielson or Daniel Bryan? He got stuck on that one a couple of times. The one funny thing I have to bring up, he referenced because I guarantee you that, well, I, I can't say that because JR did New Japan commentary. So maybe he's heard about the four pillars. But, they make such a, I mean, it's, it's like this whole company has, 
you know, they, they want to, they, they want to pick up and relocate to Tokyo there. It's an entire Japanese mindset. So they're calling Darby MJF. Um, Oh God damn it. Jungle boy. And who's the other Sammy one? and Sammy, the four pillars of AEW, like in the nineties, the four pillars of new Japan were all Japan. All Japan. Okay, All Japan, New Japan. It, there were four pillars in Japan, and I don't even remember who they were because it was 25, 30 fucking years ago in Japan. But the point is they've been calling their guys the four pillars of AEW, and JR called them the four pillows, <laughs> which, and I don't know whether he has it because he worked for New Japan. So if they were for All Japan, I guarantee he's never heard of the four pillars before, like most fucking people. Oh, he's heard of it. He's had to have heard of it. He's had to have. How? Why? He's an AEW. He's around these guys. They've been talking about it for a while, so it's not like this is okay, the first well, night okay, he's heard of it. Then he, then he heard about it three months ago when they came up with it or whatever. It's not like that the four pillars is a thing in American wrestling that everybody would instantly know what the fuck was going on. I agree with Again. you on that. I agree with you. All right. There we go. However, we know the they're not pillows. pillows now. We know they're not pillows. That, <laughs> <laughs> that I can assure you. Uh, but Jim Ross, look, Jim Ross had a really bad night, I thought. It was the worst I've, It was the worst night I've heard him on commentary, and like I said, it sounded like he knew it. Shivani's really bad, and I think Shivani's fine as the interviewer, except when he hams it up too much for Britt Baker or calling wrestlers pricks. Yeah. Can you imagine Gordon Soley doing that? Oh, here's this prick. Like, <laughs> no, it doesn't work. But on commentary, he's just yelling out what he's told to say, or he has to let you know that he's alive and he's happy to be there. Or sometimes he's just screaming out words that appear to be punchlines to himself and laughing at things during serious moments. Shivani needs to be off commentary. Loud noises. Any thoughts uh, on that? Well, I've, I can't disagree with you just because here's the thing. Tony was away from wrestling for what? Almost 20 years. And he come and he didn't grow up in the business and he didn't, he took the business seriously. And when he was working for Crockett, he would have never dreamed of exposing the business or just going around town blabbing. But he's, since he forgot about wrestling, got away from it, didn't have anything to do with it for so long. He comes back, he sees this, he's like, oh, okay, this is, this is what it's supposed to be now. He is not offended as a professional at the state of what wrestling has become because he wasn't that dedicated and into it to begin with. So as a result, he just, wow, looking at all the people diving around, he doesn't take any of it seriously because you can't, but he also doesn't take it seriously like I do because he's not offended by the complete lack of any fucking professionalism because he thinks it's supposed to be that way. He thinks he's, I was away for 20 years, I guess this is what it is now, and he's just laughing at it. Ah, ha, 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 ha. And he's happy to be there because he didn't think he'd be back on TV after all this time. But that, uh, you know, that that also doesn't make his commentary very good either because he's just happy to be there. He doesn't really know what he's seeing, but he figures, well, they're right and I'm wrong. I'm just happy to be here. So, but you can't call it like you could wrestling. He, think about this. JR at least has been around. Even I've been around all this time. And seen all these changes. But he was gone for all those years and then just pops back in and go, what the fuck? So he went straight from calling pro wrestling. And it was like he woke up out of a coma and now this is completely different. And so what's he going to fucking call? He doesn't know how to even fucking, you know, call this shit. So I, you know, I'm not arguing with you that he's not doing a very good job. I'm saying, you know, he's he's only had about a year and a half experience in sports entertainment, and he doesn't really realize what I think what he's looking at yet. I, I, I like Taz myself on commentary, but, you know, nevertheless. They, they do need a color guy up there instead of three play-by-play -play guys. I am not a big Excalibur fan. But I think Excalibur and Taz would be the best option they have right now. Excalibur can talk to the fucking basement dwellers, and Taz can talk to the 
adult wrestling fans and they and they would both at least know what was going on so that might be the case yeah and taz knows how to be entertaining and conversational without being too silly yes i think taz would be perfect for that role i mean taz is perfect for a role instead of just oh there he is and he's doing some kind of angle where his guys get beat up and then we'll see him in a few weeks <clears throat> should we get back to the program i guess well, the next match was for the AEW Ladies Championship, Britt Baker against Ty Conti. Yeah, son of a gun, I had internet trouble. It skipped right to the end of this match. What'd I miss? It sounds like the body of the match. Well, I hate that I missed anybody's body, but uh, who won? Dr. Britt Baker, DMD. Good, I'm glad to hear that. Let me just write that down in the winner's column. Ty Conti, Ooh. even though you don't really watch her stuff, shows a lot of potential well good when i when i have more time and i'm not stressed i might check that out check that out she has not done anything yet in a dentist's office or with <laughs> big swole so i think you should give her a chance where's big swole let's not bring that up let's not make them think hey let's get her on tv I should have called it the swole rule instead of the tooth and nail rule that I swore never to watch anything that either one of them ever did again. But I've I've backslid on Baker because she's good. But anyway, um, the next contest, the one we've all been waiting for, the one that made me want to see, if anything, made me want to see this show. It was this match, Eddie Kingston and CM Punk. Like Mussolini! Oh. And Grenadine, <laughs> yeah, you take me where I... <laughs> again. <laughs> what? 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 Were you improving there? You never yeah. go past that line. Yeah. What was that? You take me where I want to be, or whatever the fuck it is. Is that what do they say? I don't know. You take, take me where, me where I want to be. be. I'm a cult of personality. <laughs> not Look cult. at me. What do you see? <laughs> like Mussolini. <laughs> All right, please. And Ethel this. Mertz. All right. Um, again, serious entrance. Now he's wearing the fight shorts. Did you notice that? These are subtle, subliminal things. He didn't do the clobber in time because he got his game face on because he's pissed. This is, isn't even a, a professional match that he's had like he had with some of the other guys. It, this is a personal situation. He's coming to fight. And they're they're facing off, and the people are ready for it, and the referees try to get them settled, and all of a sudden, Kingston comes out with a back fist and just knocks him goofy and dropped him before the bell, and it brought the house down. That, I hate jump starts because they all happen so often these days, but in this case, it wasn't a jump start. Because he, boom, he KO'd him, and he's taking the, Kingston's taking the fucking glory from the people, and Punk's on his face. And they're like, shit, are we going to be able to have this match? And then Punk gets his shit back together and say, yeah, go ring the bell or whatever, and Kingston's all over him. And they had these people from the start. They had the dueling chance. Let's go, Eddie, CM Punk, whatever. Punk started firing back. We had a fight on our hands. And honestly, and I was happy to see this, and I think it works better for these personalities, the people were on Eddie's side. They weren't necessarily, they didn't hate Punk, but they were more overwhelmingly positive for Eddie Kingston. And when Punk got up on the mountain and started fucking pickling him, they actually booed a bit. And then Kingston eye pokes him and gets cheers. But both these guys, this, if they're going to do, if they're going to blur the lines between baby face and heels, this is the way you do it. Because both these guys are nominally baby faces, but you've got Kingston who has been a heel in the past and who the only reason he's a baby face is because they cheer for him. He doesn't change his style that much. He's a fighter. He's a tough guy. You got Punk, who they know can be an abrasive prick, but he's also the biggest star in the company and set their record. So they like both these guys, but both these guys fell into a personal issue. And now they're having a fight, and neither one of them is doing anything that 
CM Punk or Eddie Kingston as the people that they're presented to be wouldn't do. And then fucking, you know, at one point, Punk would take over and get a Punk chant. Eddie would take over and get an Eddie chant. Then Kingston posts Punk, and Punk gets a little color, just enough to give him those eyes and that face. And they have a big fight on the floor, but it fits here. It wasn't just the, like the Moxley match. What's number three? Oh, we go to the floor. Can't be number four or number two. It has to be number three because we do the same thing every time. It fit here that they would go out and fight on the floor and, you know, milk the crowd and flip each other off and blah, blah, blah. Punk did the three amigos and got a big pop. Second match of the night that had been tried because it's Minneapolis and Eddie and the anniversary, etc. Um, they fought on the top rope, which normally I don't like, but it wasn't like we're going to stand here motionless and try to help each other keep our balance while we set up some big move. It was their fighting. And then Kingston gets a superplex. They have a hockey fight in the middle that JR did not utter the word slobber knocker, told me that he was distracted and, and not feeling good with his health issues. And then it, at one point, Punk hit the GTS, but couldn't capitalize. He could, he would, they were selling like they were almost exhausted and this fight wore both of them down. And I saw some remark before I watched the match. I saw something on Twitter that somebody said, but we didn't like, it was so short. It was too short. What the fuck? This was perfect. They started at a, at, at a high rate of speed because they were mad and they were fighting. And over the period of time, attrition and fatigue set in. And now they're almost exhausted. And you can have a wrestling match as a shoot for 30 minutes or 45 minutes or an hour or whatever. But you don't have a 30-minute fucking fight. Anyway, Paige, Paige, <laughs> Punk gave... Kingston, you know, the elbows and, and as he had him in the middle of the ring and he's giving him the elbows, he hears the people booing because he had started to hook him up for something else. And then he heard those boos and say, you know what? Fuck it. And he gave him some knee lifts then like, here, here, give me, give me some more booze. <laughs> he knows what he's doing. And then he hit the fucking GTS and boom, one, two, three, fantastic piece of business. And Jim Ross, that was his best line of the night. All he had to say was, what a goddamn fist fight. That worked. If MJF and Darby was the best match of the show, which it was, this was the best fight. You can't say this was secondary to MJF or MJF and Darby were secondary to this because it was two completely different things. Theirs was the best match. This was the best fight. Your thoughts? I liked it. Good move not going long with everyone else going long. Remember in the old programs after Backlund became champion, they started proclaiming Bruno as the people's champion? Yes. Eddie Kingston is the people's champion right now in AEW. There you go. And similar to Austin against Brett, again, I hate to use the Austin comparisons again, but Eddie could lose and it takes nothing away from him. They'll cheer him just as loud leaving as they did coming in. He has the most unique and special relationship with the fan base right now of any wrestler in the business. And again, it's real. They didn't make anything up to make the fans like him. They told the true story of what he's been through. So that, again, that not only gets you over better, but it also lasts longer. And it, it, it creates a more special connection with the fans. They'll, they'll think not only did they have something to do with this, which they did their reactions to him is to his, they had that to do with his success, but also they know that they're not being fed some kind of fucking who shot John bullshit. It's real. Everything he said in that article on the, the, uh, what was it? Players tribune, players, players tribune. tribune. Everything he said was true. They know who he is. The only he's in a, a business where you work. It's a worked business, but he's a real guy. And that goes a long way. So that's that's a lot of punk's appeal because he comes off as real and legitimate, saying what he would say, even when he's in a working situation. 
that was the it, it was the same way with anybody who's ever drawn money practically over a long period of time you've got your you know the gimmicks that draw for you know a fad or short period or whatever but anybody who's ever been over for a long period of time and or drawn big money from bruno on down is people they believe and it's not horse shit and they're starting to actually get some of this in AEW now who who could you really believe in AEW except the ones that were just sniveling little fucking childish simpletons you could believe a bunch of that but who could you believe before we got punk danielson fucking kingston now uh some of these other guys see that's what killed cody cody was the guy that people wanted to believe in and then the people they could actually believe in showed up they saw through him like a goddamn unfrosted window at this point in full gear what did you think of the show did you think it was a positive did you enjoy it at because point, I didn't we're not no, done at, yet. at this point because I didn't watch the Hardly Boys match it was one of the better pay-per-views I've seen in a while. Uh, with the the screwiness of Cody's whole situation didn't take down the fact that Miro and Daniel as a matter of fact again MJF and Darby best match Punk and Kingston best fight second best match of the night Miro and Danielson. We're uh, we we got a pretty good string going. Um we're not going to keep it at that quality, but let's move on. The Minneapolis street fight between the dinner circle and America's top team. <sighs> there are just a lot of guys in that ring doing a lot of shit, weren't they? It, the, the, and this is the, the street fight started with more wrestling than they have in most of their TV matches. They were wrestling and doing spots. and. Then after they built that for a, a period to get Lambert in, then it all fell apart. And by the way, Junior Dos Santos and Andre Arlovsky are green, but still they're not as green as some of the people that AEW was putting on television the first six months they were on the air. But I wish somebody would tell Junior Dos Santos, don't try to work your punches because he ain't got that down yet. But he did a suplex, some other stuff, whatever. But then. They tagged Lambert in to do a little manager heat on Jericho. Jericho's down, so he's going to come in and slap him and kick him. He was overacting too much to the point where you know he's acting rather than just taunting and being a prick. It was, you know, because he was having fun in there, obviously, you could tell. But then Jericho comes back up and grabs him. And I wish somebody had walked through a couple of manager spots with him just so that he would have known how to do it but when jericho came up and grabbed him it would have been perfect if he'd have grabbed him and backed him up to the heel corner by the throat as he's choking him so that his heel partners could tag themselves in and save him rather than jumping in and running across the ring and saving him but it didn't matter because as soon as as soon as jericho's chasing lambert they immediately everybody goes to the floor and starts a fight on the floor with dives and hockey sticks and garbage cans and it's suddenly a completely different kind of match breaks out now we're in the street fight which is what i didn't want to see because the same shit as all their matches and they they're trying to tell us that everything they're using in the street fight was invented in the state of minnesota water skis and toasters <laughs> and then Hager had to jump off the top rope and everybody had to stand there and catch him. And they were on the floor and they were using all the garbage. I actually, I wasn't particularly displeased about this match until right after the Lambert spot, when they suddenly changed the match that they were having and hit the floor and stopped using the ring and brought out all the gimmicks and the plunder and the garbage. And now it's, it was every indie match ever. And you've got, at one point, you had three guys in the ring fighting and the rest of them looking under the ring to pull sh stuff out, and the fans were sitting on their hands. If this hadn't been a street fight, I think they would have had a good match because they wouldn't have had all the garbage and the weapons and the furniture. And Lambert's in the match, and it's a 10-man. That's a gimmick to begin with. So, you again, you've put a hat on a hat. We got a gimmick match. So now we're going to make it a street fight and throw all the rules out the window. And now you've just gimmicked it up. And so 
if if they'd have milked it around getting a hold of Lambert and getting the revenge on him, that they would have been able to have a regular match, would have actually registered with people instead of this fucking. But and it doesn't it it, it doesn't even work if they've got former UFC champions in the match, and if any main sports network or I guess Fox Sports probably ain't gonna carry their shit, but any sports network of any kind, ESPN, whatever, wanted to cover the UFC guys, you would have cl video clips of gimmicks and garbage cans in the ring and hockey sticks and toasters, which makes it look like a complete fucking flaming joke to a casual audience that would be watching the sports network that you might get a little fucking play out of. So they put their... They're fucking most well-known mainstream sports celebrities that are on the show in a goddamn outlaw garbage death match. It wouldn't end, and you couldn't follow it. I skipped ahead a little while. I didn't have on-screen fast-forward, so I, I was just blindly, and now there was a 15-foot ladder set up. And Baron Von Raschke was at ringside and put the claw on the other page. I love the Baron. But he be, should be clawing the manager, not one of the ref wrestlers. Santana threw the other page over the rail onto the fans and then told a security guard to get down on his hands and knees, ran, jumped off the security guard's back, dove over the rail and onto the other page and the fans and wiped one at least out who was laying on the ground grimacing until they smartened up that it wasn't one of their guys and got the camera off of him. Do we have any word on how bad that guy was hurt or when the lawsuit is filed, as Stephen P. New called? We haven't heard anything, and I wasn't even sure if it was a plant or not based on his reaction and that they were filming him for a while. No, that wasn't no fucking plant, and nothing came of it. That was, they fucking wiped out one of the fans. If this was the WWE, that guy would be a millionaire this time next year because he would sue. But nobody's good. good. These fans, apparently, they think it's, it's like at one time they were in Ring of Honor. They, they Oh, it's a it's an honor that so and so did their suicide, have a Corona dive on me and knocked my teeth out. I've said this ha is going to happen. It's going to happen. It has happened in the past. It's just not happened lately to where we got a good look at it and all the modern fans know. But no, one of these fuckers sooner or later will kick one of these people's teeth out and they will go home with no teeth in their mouth and somebody in their family that's smarter than they are is going to say, you know, the guy that owns that company is a billionaire. And there you go. Anyway, so finally, Jericho got Dan Lambert, the manager who was dressed up in a track suit and everything, and the offense that Jericho picks against a uh, completely green, totally inexperienced worker wearing a sweatsuit is to chop him. He didn't know how to sell him. You couldn't hear him. And poor Dan took one pissy little bump, and then <laughs> Jericho is trying to jerk his jacket off, I think, so he could chop him again, but he couldn't, he couldn't tear the material. Why didn't they just walk through? Dan, I'm going to give you a scoop slam. It's easy as pie. Boom. I'm going to drop an elbow on you. I want you to sell and beg. And I'll do one more thing or whatever. But it just, it was awkward. He was trying to chop him and kick him. Dan didn't know how to sell anything. And then Jericho puts him in the middle and goes for the lion salt. And as he's running to the ropes, he's screaming as loud as he can. Junior! Junior! And he jumps up on the ropes for the lion salt and stands there and stops on the ropes. Junior! And then Junior hits him with a fucking pipe in the head. And then Lambert gets a two count. And the people weren't buying this. And then Lambert tries to get to Boston Crab, but Jericho beats him up with the kendo stick and hit him in the nuts with a stapler. Didn't hit him in the nuts with a stapler. Acted like he stapled his nuts with a staple gun. This was horrible. Again, the kendo stick. You don't beat the manager up with the kendo stick, and you don't staple him in the nuts, especially if this has been in any way serious. 
when he tried to get the fucking crab, you could have come out on top of bing, bing, bing. Once again, give him a wrestling move that you can control. Why are you beating this rich millionaire up with a kendo stick? It looks like shit and hurts. And then Lambert laid there pretty much motionless forever so that Jericho could go up and hit his own frog splash as a tribute to Eddie Guerrero and then spend a lot of time looking up at the sky, making sure that everybody knew that he was thinking about Eddie for his own self-serving reasons. And that was the end of that match. I couldn't make it all the way through without skipping. Um, it, it, and it was, it was, yeah, it was there. There you go. Now Jericho got to pin me on pay-per-view. No, he didn't. You knew how to take bumps. <laughs> well, he got to pin my surrogate on pay-per-view. Garbage match, garbage program. This whole thing sucks. Anything Chris Jericho touches turns to shit immediately. This was the worst match on the show. I hope this feud is over. I have not enjoyed any of the Dan Lambert stuff, and it's only gotten hokier and sillier. And his promos have gotten more and more. If they're not rehearsed, they sure sound like he's rehearsed every single line that he was going to memorize yeah, that he's well, going to say. Well, because he's, he used, in the first couple of weeks, he used all the stuff that came natural to him, and now he's had to think of more. And that's where the difference in delivery is coming in. Yeah, this is bad. I really, really hope Fozzie has a big hit record. <laughs> please, God, if you're listening, Jesus Christ, who I love so much, please let Fozzie have the biggest record since Stairway to Heaven. Please let Chris Jericho go on an endless trip all around the world with his little Fozzie pals. Please, God, because he ruins everything on this show, and quite frankly, he holds Sammy back, and he holds Santana and Ortiz way back. Yeah, that's what I w I'd love to be able to see Santana and Ortiz in another extended tag team program like they used to have now that Ortiz has gotten shaped, lost weight. Santana's picked him, his game up and, and they're looking better than ever and they're hidden in this. And Sammy gets to peep his head out of the gopher hole every once in a while and do something on his own. But he's usually subservient to, you know, Chris's middle aged crisis. But yeah, so again, a high profile garbage match that looks like all the rest of them. You That's said something, you said something before that I wasn't going to say, because I didn't know if I was right or wrong to think it, but he was staring at that ceiling for a long time, wasn't he? Yes. I mean, you know, other people have done the tributes. They did a little Three Amigos nod in the FTR and Lucha Brothers match when that, then it fit. And they also, um, you know, which, which was it in, uh, oh, God damn, there was another place that somebody was tributing. And the point is, Jericho's the one that really milked it to make sure that everybody knew that he was looking up at heaven. And I guess as part of his religious fanaticism, but he's, it was like he was trying to sap Eddie's baby facedness from the heavens. He was, he was being work. a little obvious with it. It didn't work. Didn't work. You know what will work? No. My man Jay Lethal is now all elite. And they actually did this right. They had Tony Schiavone introduce a new AEW signing. Out comes Jay Lethal. He's got music. He's got a, you know, the video wall, whatever. He comes out looking good, dressed up. They're already chanting lethal, lethal. He did a good promo because he's a well-spoken and personable guy. Challenged Sammy Guevara for the TNT title. Uh, this coming Wednesday night, Sammy comes out and accepts. Of course, again, they're both baby faces, but it's almost, if, if you're not MJF or Cody, it's almost impossible to be a heel in this fucking environment. And I can't wait to see that match already. I've always been a fan of Jay's. And here's another thing. Besides... His work, which has always been good, Jay's the guy when we got him in Ring of Honor, you wanted him to go to the TV stations. Because remember when Sinclair first bought Ring of Honor, a lot of the TV stations were bringing guys in to do little you know, PR things or news spots or whatever. Jay had been on TNA, he'd been on national television, so people kind of knew his name, but at the same point, 
he was featured on that program. Now we used to send him to TV stations and PR deals and public appearances. You knew he was always going to be on time. He's personable and intelligent. He can speak to those people. He didn't come off like some dumb gig headed fucking outlaw wrestler. He was, um, he, he was always the guy that the go-to guy for PR and appearances and stuff like that with stuff outside the wrestling bubble because he was so professional and you could, and he wasn't going to show up impaired and he wasn't going to fucking be late and he wasn't going to piss anybody off or offend anybody or hurt anybody's feelings. So again, here, I can't wait to see him and Sammy Guevara. I think they'll have a tremendous match and I believe that they'll be serious about it. So they've, they got another one here. I've, I, I I, again, and the WWE, the state of their talent roster, and they hear that Ring of Honor has released everybody, and they don't go for Jay Lethal, they don't go for the Briscoes, they don't go for a, a one or two others. They they again let the opposition take all the fucking wrestlers that the fans, especially the most dedicated fans are sympathetic to because they've either been fired or their companies let them go or they've gone out of business or whatever. And they become bigger in AEW than they ever were anywhere else because the people are sympathetic to them as people. So now they got another one, Jay Lethal. Glad to see he's got a nice big contract. He has a nice big contract, we assume, and we think he'll be a hero on that roster, but will he be a stat hero? Well, you never know about that because the statistics... Very, but did you know, did you know, Brian, I'm sure you knew this, that nobody plays daily fantasy sports to lose. You don't play it to lose because winning feels so much better. But traditional fantasy sports are a long-term losing proposition because you never know who or what you're up against. It's a mystery. But Stat Hero is the first of its kind daily fantasy sports platform where it's you versus the house. Head-to-head -head fantasy matchups, winner take all. Stat Hero shows you their lineups before you play. And it sounds almost illegal. It sounds positively... It's legal. It's completely legal. But it sounds illegal. It sounds unfair. It sounds not cricket. Because they show you their lineups before you play, and then you handpick the team that you want to face one-on-one. -on -one. This is like cheating. It can't possibly be legal to do these type of things this never before seen innovation of a fantasy sports and sports betting hybrid has stat hero players clocking odds that are over four times better better than what you say i got no clue but they are better because you don't have to compete against thousands of experts or unknowns unknown people out there stat hero puts you in control of your fate you're in control of the stakes you decide how much you're going to play for and Stat Hero has no choice but to take it. That's right. Take it, bitch. Take it. You got no choice. <laughs> no, no, there's a choice. No, they say they have no choice but to take it because they are daring you to beat them. So since they've opened their big fat mouths and they've made the dare, now they got to lay there and take it, baby. They got no choice. They have no way of escape. Stat Hero this head This took to a head. real bad turn. Well, Stat Hero head to head is what daily fantasy should be, one on one. I don't know. I've had fantasy some days that were one on three or four, but one on one is a place to start. So, right now, you can sign up for free at stathero.com slash JCE. Use the promo code JCE for a 100% deposit match. That means whatever you deposit, they will match it. It's like you're doubling your money. What have you got to lose? Your home, your car, your house, your wife, your kids, everything. But that's, don't think about that. Think about how you're going to kick Stat Hero's ass because they're cheating for you and showing you their lineups and shit. Well, that's just, that's just crazy. StatHero.com slash JCE. Use the promo code JCE for a 100% match. Terms and conditions apply. Benny the Bone Breaker will come and collect if you don't pay up. But most of the time, you're going to win on these things. 
No one will come to find you, but hopefully you do win with Stat Hero. Well, no, they won't come to find you. They're already going to know where you are. You're playing them, right? You got to register these things. They'll know exactly where you are. So they can send you your money. That's right. Run for help with Stat Hero. Run, well, run for help from Stat Hero. If you if you win too much of their money, they're liable to get pissed. No, they want you to win. It's so a, they want you to win? I mean, by the way, it sounds like an awful business strategy. They want you to take their money. Yeah, they, you know, this is crazy. They're showing you their shit. <laughs> they're cheating for you. They're showing you what you're playing against. They're giving you as much money as you put into this thing if you use the promo code JCE at stathero.com. And then on top of that, they want you to actually take their money. This is a horrible business strategy. Are you sure they're paying for these spots? It almost sounds like they're daring you. Like, we think you're an idiot. You're they, not well, going to get it, our money. It doesn't almost sound like that. It specifically says it right here. Stat Hero has no choice but to take it because they're daring you to beat them. So they've double dog dare you. And if you people out there in Cult of Cornette land have one single hair on your pubic balls, you will take this dare and you'll kick their fucking asses. Take all their money. Leave them penniless, broken in a gutter on the side of the street with a whiskey bottle in their back pocket and a sad song on their lips. That's what you're going to do to stathero.com slash JCE. Terms and conditions apply. All right, should we talk about the main event? I think that's what everyone wants to hear. That was the biggest match on the show going into it. Well, it wasn't for me, but going in Kingston and Punk was the biggest one for me, but MJF and Darby was interesting and a pleasant surprise. And Miro was a shock, but I got to say the, hold on, where's my, I, you know, I got, I, since we got stat hero on, I got the statistics on this. I rated everything. The best match what? was MJF. The best match was MJF and Darby. The best fight was Punk and Kingston. The second best match was Miro and Danielson. There were American top team in the dinner circle and the goofs against the Jurassics weren't matches, so we can't count that. And I won't penalize the girls by rating them because I didn't watch it. But, shockingly enough, think about what I'm saying here. Have I ever said this before? The match involving Twinkle Toes McFinger Bang was the third best match and fourth best event on the entire program. <laughs> wow, that's Canada, almost cause, cause, a compliment. Because we amazing. had a best fight. Almost? What are you talking about? That is the best. That's the highest I've ever ranked Twinkle Toes. This wasn't bad. It would have been much better with Paige and almost anybody else, but it wasn't bad. They seemed most of the time to actually be serious, which was amazing for Harpo Finger Fuck. But, hey, you know, it, it, Adam Page is a great baby face. He sells, he's got fire, he's got athleticism. He can speak, as we heard, when he's given something to say in the opportunity, and he sounds like he means it. He's a great baby face. As, as I've said, what has put me off my feed on Adam Page was the ridiculous way that they presented him for the past year, year and a half, first having to be the, the, the team with twinkle toes and then the, the sad drunk and the moroseness and the problem and the palling around with the job guys and everything. This imagine the people love him. Imagine where he'd be. If they, if he'd actually been associating with main event people and doing shit that made sense and not failing at everything for all this time. But this is what they wanted to see. I thought at first they would probably, they would be crazy now that originally it was, it would have been great to me if Paige had beaten Twinkle Toes for the title and ended his reign. Then I saw the booking, and then I see Danielson and Punk come in. I said, well, it'd be crazy to beat Twinkle Toes now when they've got these stars that can be utilized. But at the same time, after I see this, I go, you know what? These people don't care whether anything makes sense, so at least Twinkle Toes will no longer be the champion. That's not the way to look at it. Well, no, that's the, that's the way I'm he... looking at it. At least if we get him out of the title picture, then Paige versus 
And again, it's all baby faces, so it doesn't make any sense. But Page versus Punk, Page versus Danielson, Page versus Lethal, Page versus Cole, Page versus a variety of people will be a lot better than if you stuck Harpo in there with any of those people. So since it doesn't really matter who the champion is, because these people are going to eat whatever you feed them, at least we don't have to look at Twinkle Toes in the title matches. And they're not going to, they don't do rematches. So we don't have to see this one again. We certainly never got to see FTR and the Bucks again. On that topic real quick, it really makes me think about Omega and Danielson. Because we all thought that one match, which went to a 30-minute draw, would have been the set up a rematch. For the title, we thought. <laughs> but, who, but who knows? What? They they decided to do this because they decided they were going to do it two years ago, and they're still going to do it regardless of what has changed. And I'm not saying Adam Page doesn't deserve to be the champion. I like Adam Page. I've, that's why I've been indignant at the stupid things they've had Adam Page do and say for the past I don't know how long. Because I like him. Certainly like him a lot better than Twinkle Toes. But it, it just, you know, ah, trying to figure out what they're doing. Anyway, and, and here's another thing. The, at least they wanted to see Paige win, so they were reacting to Twinkle Toes like he was a heel for once. Because normally he gets cheered most like everybody else. But they were even, you know, uh, was it fuck... Kenny, fuck Omega, what was the chant that was going? It was fuck somebody or fuck something. I can't remember what the name was. Fuck Kenny, fuck Omega, fuck Twinkle Toes, fuck whatever. It wasn't fuck Twinkle Toes. I know that. That's a tough thing to chant, quite frankly. Well, fuck Twinkle Toes, fuck Twinkle Yeah, you can't do it. <clears throat> it doesn't really work, but here's the thing. <laughs> Brian, is it an accurate statement to say that the fans of AEW are the ones above all else that know that this is all a work and they probably really like all these people. And we mentioned that MJF went out in the crowd the other night on TV. Nobody took a shot at him. So nobody has any heat whatsoever where the fans want to physically attack them, right? Nobody has heat where the fans want to physically attack them. There are guys that have heat where the fans don't want to see them, where the fans decide right. they don't want to see them. But that's a completely different thing. But nobody has heat where the fans want to attack them right now. No. In the 70s and 80s, there were, we couldn't even make a list now. We don't have time of the list of heels in wrestling that the fans would have willingly and did attempt and succeed sometimes in attacking physically, right? Yeah. So how come in the 70s and 80s when guys had killing heat that people wanted to knife them and cut them and stab them and they cut their tires on their car and whatever else, they still <laughs> never chanted, fuck so-and-so. But now the people in unison, 10,000 people in an arena are chanting, fuck this guy when they know it's bullshit and they don't even really dislike him. Does that make any sense? Could it be that maybe people back then just had the common courtesy not to say fuck in unison out loud in an arena with children around? They preferred to say it privately, such as from row three, section four, fuck you, like that, but not chanting it in the building. I just found that hilarious. They had people they wanted to fucking kill, but they would edit their language but now these they they would be friends with these people, but they still will chant fuck them at the top of their lungs. What's happened to society? It doesn't make any sense. People wanted to stab wrestlers and the security barrier was a rope. Yes. And yes. now <laughs> nobody wants to get up from their chair except to clap. And there's a giant barricade. It's like getting across the Berlin Wall and all <laughs> they want to do is pat people on the back. We People were bringing guns to the matches. They shot at Bobby Heenan. They've drawn knives at people, and we had a fucking clothesline to keep that angry mob back. That It, it makes perfect sense. Anyway, um, Paige is great. I just don't... I've got to be honest. I try to watch these all the time, like, okay, putting personal feelings aside... I'll forget he wrestled the sex toy. I'll forget he wrestled the nine-year-old girl. I'll forget about the all the times he's worn 
you know, genie costumes and stuck his fingers up people's asses and engaged in all this comedy bullshit. And I'll just watch him as a wrestler. It doesn't work because I still, I don't like his movements. I don't like his facials. I don't like his wrestling style. I don't like his mannerisms. I don't like his body language. It, it, it all is off putting to me. And I don't like it the way he puts his matches together because they always seem so much longer than they really are. MJF and Darby flew by. It was same length as this. This, it's just, it. part of it is he just does a video game match. It doesn't make sense. It's people hitting each other and I'll hit you for a while and then you hit me for a while and blah, blah, blah. And what finally, and they, they did a referee bump. I thought Tony Khan says we don't do referee bumps. So Twinkle Toes pulls the referee into the buckshot lariat, and that gives Don Fallis a chance to come in with the title belt. But Page got him and bumped him. Twinkle Toes got the belt, swing and a miss. Page hits the dead eye. Referee Aubrey, the second ref, comes in. One, two, kick out. And then Aubrey goes out to check on the first referee, and they try to trade, and Twinkle Toes can't throw a punch to save his life. And it was basically some more back and forth. It's in turn, we'll do moves to each other and the people will pop on them because, you know, they look good. And then here comes the Young Bucks. And they walk down to ringside. Page hits the one-winged fairy on Twinkle Toes, so he gets his own move on Twinkle Toes. Two count. And then Page hits the buckshot lariat. And boom, and... Twinkle Toes is staggering, and he goes to the other side, and he goes for another one, but there's Pie Face Buck. And he and Pie Face stare at each other, and Pie Face slightly nods at him and doesn't interfere, and Paige does another buckshot lariat. Boom, one, two, three. So, if the Bucks now turned on Twinkle Toes, are they baby faces now? Why did they come down to not do anything? It, 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 it is Olivier going to be upset about this? Is this going to ruin their friendship? I think is it, are you trying to ex tell me that all the heels needed all this time was just the apology that Adam Page gave them the other night on TV? <laughs> oh, okay, everything's fine now. I think the Bucks probably watched a lot of As the World Turns or General Hospital or something growing up. Do the younger generation think like this, that they are so bereft of any guts or fucking intestinal fortitude that these wimpy, wishy-washy people that uh, they portray themselves as wimpy and wishy-washy and we don't know what the fuck we're doing? Does that resonate with these people somehow? I'm not exactly sure. The personalities in some way resonate with these people. That's for sure. But like you said, it was kind of like an arranged hit on Kenny Omega. The Bucks came out and the one Buck gave his nod. It's okay. Kill him. Go and there, for it. And, and, and there was Twinkle Toes sitting there in the barber's chair with the fucking foam on his face and the sheet over him, not knowing that Nitty's hit squad was coming in from behind. Well, the Albert Anastasia of AEW lost the title. <laughs> to adam page oh and then the dork jobbers come in to lift not brian danielson not cm punk not eddie kingston not any of the top baby faces in this company come in to celebrate lifting up adam page on their shoulders for toppling the reign of the evil champion it's the dork jobbers that come in and set him up on their shoulders. And that's the last. That would be like fucking rock beating Austin for the belt. And here comes Kai and Ty to celebrate with him. How about that? This ended up being what we joked about. The Bucks got mad at Adam Page's behavior because he started drinking. And that drove him away. Meanwhile, he found all new friends that seemed to like him just fine. If we yeah. got to really be honest about things. Yeah. But once he stopped drinking, and once he came back and apologized for his behavior while drinking, <laughs> then the Buck's like, you know what? Fuck Kenny. 
Does this mean the Bucks are going to go back to dressing normal? Like, does this change them? Did they start acting out because of falling out with Adam Page? They lost their one cowboy friend, and they just couldn't take it. So they went and started dressing like dweebs. I think that you may have hit upon something. Oh, and I forgot about the, the cowboy friend. Did you enjoy Adam Page riding a horse through the streets of Minneapolis? <laughs> that was a really neat did, video. It was. And did yeah. you enjoy the tumbleweed outside the Target Center? <laughs> the Dark and, Order were in that too, like running from one building to another. You saw yes, that? And, yes. I, I didn't know who they were. I thought I th that's the people that were late. The doors are already open. They got to get to their seats. <laughs> Uh, and they had the good, the bad, and the ugly takeoff music, and people piped in. They piped in the cowboy shit chants. They even had cowboy shit on one of the flashing road signs. But how did they find a time where there was no traffic in in Minneapolis to do that? I would think there'd be traffic there even three, four, five in the morning. Right, unless you paid to shut it down so you could do a shoot. <laughs> but you notice he didn't get up a lot of speed on that horse down those city streets. He would just he just kind of cantered in and then got off the horse. We've never been shown any evidence that he actually can ride a horse at speed, have we? Well, I mean, you almost have to, because I've ridden a few horses, and once they get started going, you're pretty much on the horse. If they're if they're riding or if they're running, you can't hardly stop them unless you know what you're doing. So I don't know. Hey, someone want to get some heat? Punch the horse. <laughs> Just slug the horse. It'll be the greatest but, angle ever. <laughs> but not ride, but in, in all fairness to him, riding those horses on the city streets are, it's not easy because, you know, they're, they're used to the, the, the tracks, the dirt and the grass and the, the wilds and the fields and things. I told you a story when Dusty tried to ride the horse into Roanoke, didn't I? I don't know. The Midnight Rider? Oh, fuck. We're at the Roanoke Civic Center. And the Midnight Rider has lost the, or Dusty Rhodes has lost a loser leave town match. I think it was to the Horseman. And the Midnight Rider's coming back. What was that, 87? 88. 88, when he did the Midnight Rider in Crockett. He did it in Florida a few years earlier. Yeah, and then Watts did so, it in Mid-South in 85. Yeah, and then Watts did it. But we're at the Roanoke Civic Center, and we're doing a Crockett TV taping. And the Midnight Rider is going to ride into the arena in front of all those thousands of people on the back of this stallion, right? Because he's the Midnight Rider. Well, one of the problems was it's raining outside. And when it was raining outside, and when all the guys came in and the TV crew and they brought all the equipment in, there's a big garage door at the back of the Roanoke Civic Center, and then you come in that with all the equipment or the forklifts or whatever, and then you go up this concrete ramp that's maybe... 50 feet long and at the top of that ramp is the entrance way to the arena and that's where they bring the monster trucks out if they have a monster truck show or rodeo whatever they bring out the livestock but the problem is this is a wrestling show they don't have the dirt down on the ground they don't have the livestock they've just got one horse and all of the equipment that they brought up at ramp had dropped all that water because it's raining outside and now dusty who in 1988 was probably clocking in between 320 and 330, gets up on this poor horse's back, and the horse, if I could have spoke horse language, he would have been saying to me, oh, my fucking back. And you can see, you can see the horse bending in the middle. And then the cue starts for the segment, and they're trying to get the, the Dusty's trying to ride the horse up that wet concrete ramp, and the horse is slipping. And and it was almost if Rene Goulet had been there, he'd be like, the horse is down, the horse is down. That horse was almost to its knees by the time it got to the top of that ramp. And we were watching back there thinking he's going to fucking, the, all of them are going to fall over and roll right into the arena. And as soon as the horse got to the top of that ramp, he finally got his feet underneath him. And when Dusty came out, it looked okay. But for a, about 50 feet there, we were convinced that neither Dusty nor the horse was going to make it into the arena. You know, the, 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 the animals, sometimes they won't work with you. Never share the screen with a kid or an animal. Can you imagine if something would have happened to Dusty with that horse in 88 and then all these guys like Telly would have been like, oh my God, I love Dusty so much. I can't believe this. Everyone who was ripping on him and hating him <laughs> yeah. and wanting him out of the fucking company would have been putting him over.
Lawler rode the horse into the Mid-South Coliseum for his match with Hulk Hogan yeah. in 81. And it was a white, he had complete white tights, white singlet, white crown with the jewels on it, white boots, and he wanted a white horse, right? So when I got a horse, but this was, as I recall, it was Feb, was it February 9, 1981? Sounds about right, but it was in February. I was down there for the match, to shoot the match, right? The only time that Hogan came back after he'd become a star to Memphis to work with Lawler. And they brought the horse in, and apparently, maybe the people with livestock backgrounds will know more about this, but in the wintertime, even a white horse, it's, it gets like brownish, or the it it's not bright white. It's got colored hair on it that it gets in the wintertime, and they had to whitewash the horse. They had to paint the horse white. To get a completely white horse for Lawler to ride that fucking horse out there. Can you imagine? And I took pictures. I've got pictures of him posed sitting on top of the horse after they painted it. Can you imagine the guy that went home that night and his wife said, how was your day, honey? Well, I had to paint a horse white. Maybe it's not as funny now, 40 years later. Maybe not. Have you ever painted a horse white? I've never painted a horse. No, I try to stay away from horses, quite frankly. Oh, I thought you were going to say you try to stay away from painting horses. What's the matter with horses? Horses are honorable people. Were well, those your final thoughts on Omega versus Page? Well, my, no, my final thought is, have you ever had a horse steal anything from you? No, I have not. Well, there you go. Yes, yeah, so are we still on this? Uh, yeah, new new champion, Adam Page, the hangman. Cowboy shit. At least Twinkle Toes don't have the belt anymore. Can we Can we send him off on an on a round the world tour to go away and learn a new hold. Well, we'll see what happens because AEW hasn't done rematches. Like we've said, because the Omega Danielson one was naturally set up. I've also heard that Omega is really banged up. We'll see if that means he actually takes time off. Cause they obviously set something up with him and the bucks here, him and page here. You have Cole in the mix with his guys. So the question is if he takes time off to heal up or if he's around. And what in the world is going to happen next? We'll find out. I think he'll work on video games. Oh, you mean the AEW? AEW. Why, with anybody. I don't give... If, if the next thing that Twinkle Toes does has nothing to do with getting in a wrestling ring where I have to watch him on television, I will support him to the fullest extent of the law. So Danielson went to a draw with Omega, and now Danielson beat Miro to get a title shot or to be number one contender. Was it number one contender or to get a title shot? What did it said to get a title shot? So it's now Danielson and Paige. <laughs> Two more baby faces. <laughs> Although Danielson's, I, I keep saying it. I know the fans cheer him, but they cheer everyone except Cody and MJF, naturally. But Danielson's working like a heel, I think. Well, I know, but how do you make him the person... Uh, when everybody know he had to retire once doing what he loved because of injuries and then he fought to come back and and the evil empire held him down but now he's free you can't make that guy a, a fucking heel if he comes out and takes a fucking rusty dildo and sodomizes somebody with it do you choose the interloper or the guy who's been here from the beginning if you have two guys like that well but it, hopefully for them Many of the fans that are seeing that will be new fans that haven't been around because they're supposed to get some new ones with all these big names. So hope there'll be Danielson fans who are going, who's this fucking kid fighting Danielson? So you'll have, but I just, it, I think back to every main event babyface wrestler that I ever knew or worked with over the past 50 years. And if you came up to them and said, yeah, I've got you some great opponents in this territory. They're all baby faces, just like you. You're going to wrestle all of them. They wouldn't even got out of their, their bag out of their car. They'd have turned around and fucking left. I, all right. Well, coming <laughs> out of that pay-per-view event, there was probably a really great transition to the next spot. However, we are very tired. We have been working a lot. We've been recording and editing and uploading and cutting and, and doing all sorts of things. Cutting! Cutting. Cutting nice. video. Cutting video. I mean. Cutting video, but you don't want to cut yourself. You want to that try to... That wasn't what I meant. You want to try to reduce as many... They're always going to happen. 
those accidents where you're escaping your mans, they're always going to happen, but you want to reduce them. That's why you want the professional stuff. So if, or here's another transition. If rather than seeing another match between Twinkle Toes and Adam Page, you'd rather shave your balls? Well, now's your chance. Folks, the holidays are coming up. It's time to give thanks. Thanks to our friends at Manscaped for the performance package 4.0 from the global leaders in below the waist grooming. The lawnmower 4.0 trimmer to tame your bush. The performance package 4.0, which has everything you're going to need to make everything slick and smooth and shiny and shaved and smelly good. If your holiday smelly spread good. Is, is smelly good, they got smelly that? good stuff too. Smelly, smelly good? good? Smelly good. If you think your holiday spread is good, well, you ought to spread your legs and stick some Manscaped up in there, folks. The Performance Package <laughs> 4.0 <laughs> what? has everything you need to be all the things I talked about. Smooth and slick and smelly good. The Lawnmower <laughs> 4.0 Trimmer. The Weed Whacker Ear and Nose Hair Trimmer to chop up the worst weeds in your nose and your ear. Or if, like some people, you have two of them, your ears. There's no S on the top of here. <laughs> this nose and ear hair trimmer, or ears hair trimmer. They're not English majors. They're working on all these things like the lawnmower. They're working on pubic hair. It uses a 9,000 RPM motor-powered 360-degree rotary dual-blade system to provide, provide proprietary performance. <laughs> You're not an English major either. <laughs> in safe technology. You can't forget the Manscaped's liquid formulations. They're like the pumpkin pie and ice cream after Thanksgiving dinner. You can't live without it, and sometimes it makes you shit. The Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant <laughs> and the Crop Reviver Toner Spray will have your balls living in turkey heaven, folks. And for the gifters out there, Manscaped is here to seal the deal with two free gifts from the Performance Package 4.0, the Manscaped Boxers and the Shed Travel Bag that you you can put your boxers and your balls right in the bag and take off. You can have that way you can have the it. little fellas with you anywhere you want them. What? Yeah, we always need an extra coin purse for your little fellows. Gifting manscaped products, you can become the family favorite and they've also been busy. <laughs> well, that's right. Think of it. Think of this. <laughs> let's say you I am thinking about it. That's well, what makes it funny. Let's say you give your father-in-law the performance package 4.0 and he shaves his balls and his dick smells good for the first time since the Eisenhower administration and your mother-in-law is going to come and give you the wink and go, "Hey, hey, cuz now I don't have any hairs between my teeth like I usually do." Oh, what are you this and should not Christmas, be part. What are you talking about? Let's just Christmas say Christmas time. It's Christmas time. She's going to give one a year. It's going to be at Christmas anyway. Well, it could be the birthday, but listen. That, besides the point, the weed whacker is really what I think the selling point will be. You don't want to think of your father-in-law's genitals. You want to think about them getting that hair out of their ears. Well, yes, or either that, or you want to stick some hair in your ears so you don't have to hear your in-laws. But whether it's ears, or whether it's nose, or whether it's the sphincter, you know. But and I'll tell you what, they've got uh. a a taint tamer spray that doesn't come in the performance package 4.0, but that taint tamer spray, I'll tell you what smells like a new Orleans cat house on Thursday. But anyway, they've also launched their refined body wash and two in one shampoo plus conditioner. And both of those feature the manscaped signature scent and will help unlock your confidence this year. I can't tell you what it smells like, because it's proprietary and it's signature, but it's good. It does not smell like a man eating from Munda cheese in the septic tank of a slaughterhouse. Folks, whether you want the performance package 4.0 or just want to piss off your in-laws, whatever the case, go to manscaped.com slash JCE to get 20% off and free shipping. 20% off and free shipping, manscaped.com slash jce when you get 20 percent, and you're going to get 100 percent off of your nut hair and 20 percent off of the cost of removing it and uh, not everybody well, we can't guarantee 100 percent removal of of any hair uh as you put it before well we we can get yes we can guarantee if you i mean 100 one or two well, if no, you but, miss one or two. But what is what is cutting it? What is removing it? Is it just slicing it or is it pulling no, it out from the root? That's no, removal. No, for heaven's sake, don't That's say removal. 
don't say slicing or pulling out because it's not slicing, it's trimming, and it's not pulling it out because these blades are nice and sharp, except they, they reduce nicks and snags and tucks and tugs, but they are still sharp enough to cut those pubic hairs because not everybody is lucky like Hotchkiss Featherbottom and has had that early onset male pubic baldness going on where they don't have to shave their crotch. But anyway, manscaped.com. Yeah. Manscaped.com <laughs> slash JCE, 20% off and free shipping. We love the folks at Manscaped and that performance package, especially the Lawnmower 4.0. I love the LED light. You see, it shouldn't be slash JCE. It should be trim JCE. Well, they can't put to it demonstrate in there. how in safe the, the product is. In the computer speak, there's no signal or no little icon or whatever for trim. It's slash. There's no but icon Manscaped for trim? Dot, Manscaped.com. <laughs> little, little, little slanted line, JCE. All right, well, let's... A uh, little slanted line. Let's get away from the trim and let's get to a question or two. Yeah, last thing we want is be around any trim. Well, here on this show, let's, uh, let's get to some wrestling questions. Jim, this first one here on this memorable episode was uh-huh. sent to corny drive through at gmail.com from Joel in San Marcos, Texas. Hello, Jim and Brian. Hello! Michael Cole was recently on Pat McAfee's podcast and said that when he's asked about his job with WWE and how he's been there for 25 years, he says he's an actor. His quote, I've told people that I am a fake announcer for a scripted sport that uses a fake name. My question for Jim is, do you think that his answer was influenced by Kevin Dunn or anyone else in the offices of WWE. Well, yes. And let me say this. I've worked with Michael Cole. I was there when he first started. I like the guy. I've never had any arguments with him. Uh, The fact that he said that, I would normally say he's a piece of shit. And I probably won't ever speak to him again if the opportunity arises just because he said that. But yes, he got that from Kevin Dunn because that's what Kevin Dunn thinks. Kevin Dunn doesn't like wrestling. He doesn't like the wrestling fans. He doesn't like wrestlers. And he goes out of his way to try to tell people to say things like that or to believe things like that. I don't know whether Michael Cole believes it, but I know that he says it because he's heard shit like that from Kevin Dunn and Michael Cole was Kevin Dunn's boy because he was not a wrestling person. So Kevin naturally liked him. So I hate to hear that somebody that I've, Never had a big issue with personally has to say bullshit like that, but that's indicative of the fucking prick that Kevin Dunn is and the way he teaches. You would get people, editors at the, at the studio and production assistants that would talk about the business that they were in the same way because they learn bad habits and misinformation from the top, just like the Trump administration. You would hear people parroting the bullshit that came out of his mouth that worked for him. Whether they believed it or not, they knew they had to say it. But with Kevin Dunn's the same thing. It's not wrestling. We don't do wrestling. And there's nothing wrong with telling people that it's all a work and it's fake. And there's nothing wrong with the word fake. Because Kevin Dunn's not a man. He's never been in a fight in his life. He has no guts. He has no balls. He's a suck-up sycophant that's fucking blown Vince for 40 years to keep a fucking job that he's obviously... Uh, never wanted to begin with, but he just took it to make money. He didn't want to be in the wrestling business, and he's been trying to get out of it for 40 years to become a major Hollywood producer and win Emmys. Fuck Kevin Dunn, and honestly, Michael, if you hear this, I'm sorry to have to say it, but fuck you too for being a piece of shit and knocking the business that you've been making a very good living at for 25 years. Fuck all of you. How's that? Did we did we finish up good there? Fuck you, Michael, and fuck you done again, you Bucky Beaver piece of shit. Now you got me in a bad mood. You know, you weren't even that mad about him two minutes ago, and then I think no, the Kevin Dunn. No, but I think about it. Yeah. The more I think about it. And, and that's, again, that's why the wrestlers think they're actors and entertainers, because they're told that, and, and, and some of them are egotistical enough to believe it. 
And that's why the, the, the business that has made every single one of those sorry sacks of shit motherfuckers working for the WWE, whether in front of the camera or behind the camera, a very good living, they will pass up no opportunity, say the most egregiously rotten, horrible things about their own line of work that they possibly can just to make themselves look good in front of people who don't like wrestling when they don't know that those are the, that you exist to begin with. The only thing that you do when you knock the wrestling business is to appeal, uh, make yourself appeal to people who don't like wrestling, and they ain't going to watch you anyway. It's just because Kevin Dunn has that problem with his small penis and his fucking large ego and that he can't be involved in something so common and ordinary as wrestling. He's a big-time TV person. And he tries to make the people at work for him think the same way. That's why the worst. There were some people that would get jobs in the studio that were actually wrestling fans. And they would slip under the radar and get the job. And then Kevin would, would eliminate or subliminate or move them around or whatever. Once he found out about it, because he didn't want anybody that liked the actual wrestling business working in the fucking studio. He just wanted this fucking the people who would buy his bullshit about it being sports entertainment and not nothing to do with wrestling and that you shouldn't have any respect for it or you shouldn't protect the secrets or you shouldn't kayfabe. That was, a, it was a whole fucking, uh, we were at 1241 East Main Street trying to run a wrestling company and he was over at 120 Hamilton Avenue trying to be a Hollywood superstar and telling everybody that wrestling sucked. Fuck him. I have friends who worked in that building, not on the wrestling side, but on the business side. And almost to a man, everyone found him repulsive. But one of my friends told me a story, and I don't think he was unique in this happening to him, because I think I heard it from someone else too, but it happened firsthand to my friend. In the middle of a meeting he had to have with Kevin, Kevin took off his shoes and socks and started cutting his toenails. What? His desk. Yeah, for real. Oh my God. Yeah. Like, the person who told me has never, ever told me a lie, and I've known him for a very, very long time. There's no way this would be the one thing he lied about. Kevin Dunn started cutting his toenails in the middle of a meeting. And boy, just the fact that, I mean, using those hedge trimmers, that would be distracting when you're trying to have a conversation. <laughs> have you ever seen that fucking little beaver-looking motherfucker's big feet? I've never seen his big face. I don't think I've really been around Kevin Dunn much in person. Maybe when I was younger, but... Well, you're lucky. Yeah. As Mama Cornette would say, with those big chompers, he could eat a watermelon through a rail fence. All right, well, let's eat through a few more questions before we wrap things up here on the show. Jim, this next one was sent to Quinny Drive through at gmail.com from Keith in Queens. On the post-Full Gear press conference... A reporter asked Brian Danielson about his ability to finish matches in many ways, and the fact that since he has come to AEW, he might not necessarily have a finishing move. Brian answered that finishing moves are actually a recent addition to pro wrestling, and a guy like Luthez had multiple ways to finish a match. What? Wait, with, what? Without having a finishing move. Okay. So my question to you is. Are definitive finishing moves needed in wrestling? We've come to this now. <laughs> is, is oxygen needed for life? God damn it. For one thing, no, a finish, an individual finishing move for a particular wrestler is not a modern addition. And since the example of Luthez was made, have you ever heard of the Luthez Press? Of course. Okay. Yes. Luthez and every other wrestler in the history of the world has had a primary finishing move or their hold as they get grab your best hold used to be the thing that was indicating the guys were going to shoot. When you would tell a guy you were going to the ring with that, grab your best hold. That means, okay, we're on, it's on, right? Every strangler Lewis. The headlock, for fuck's sake. He made a career out of it. The fucking, the, the headlock 
uh, uh, crusher thing that he had to squeeze together to, to, you know, increase the power of his headlock, blah, blah, blah. That doesn't mean that every wrestler that had a definitive finishing maneuver never won a match any other way, especially when you come to main events, especially when you come to disputed decisions, especially when you come to finishes that are supposed to start or continue programs. No, you're not just hitting your finish on the guy and beating him. No, you're not just grabbing a submission hold on him and making him tap out like now. You built to a certain finish that happened sometimes as a fluke to necessitate a rematch. In that case, it's not a wrestling move that wins. So, I mean, you fucking you have a double knockout in the middle of the ring, one guy falls on top of another, whatever the case. There's all kinds of different ways to finish a match and to win a match or to lose a match. But the idea that a wrestler having his own specialty hold is a modern invention is ridiculous. Wild Bill Longson and the pile driver in the 1940s, Buddy Rogers and the figure four leg lock in the late 40s, early 50s. Uh, I, I could do this all day, but I won't bore everybody. I already have. Um, what is a new invention, as I've been talking about the past few shows, is the idea that a finish just comes out of nowhere with no build and no roller coaster ride that's got the people right up at the top and they're ready to end. Boom! And there it is. It just, we're going to do everything we decided to do. And then when we're finished, one of us is going to grab a hold and the other one's going to pass out or tap out. That's how they're building finishes now. So, what I love Brian to death, but what he said was exactly the opposite of what is the actual case. Now, whereas before guys had their own holds and built their hold and their hold was almost, or move or whatever, almost inescapable, almost unstoppable until you got to a main event guy and then they might kick out of it or whatever. Now just everybody puts a hold on everybody and beats them. And out of nowhere. So I don't, I don't know what he's talking about. All right. Well, let's move on to another question here, Jim. I, do you? Well, obviously, everyone's always had signature maneuvers, signature holds, whatever you want to call it. Yes. The idea that a guy could just win. We haven't seen too many guys in recent memory being the last 40, 50 years on TV that would win a match with a different move every time. I mean, every now and then is someone with that gimmick. But the idea that it's just a regular occurrence that people don't have finishing maneuvers. Yeah, and 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 the Midnight Express At least started, in the TV era, I don't know. The Midnight Express started doing that on TBS, winning a match something different every week. Because that was different and that was... A, but it was still a finishing move. And then we, after a while, we took the best ones and we eliminated some of the ones that didn't work that well. But uh, again, a lot of time a finish can be a small package or something. Uh, the manager tripped the guy and he fell into a small package. One, two, three. Well, that needs a rematch or what it can be anything, but it has to make sense and it has to be built to it. Can't just come out of nowhere for fuck's sake. You're not a big fan of modern submissions that are influenced by mixed martial arts. Is that fair to say? I, I am a big fan of. I'm a big fan of the physical combat itself being influenced by mixed martial arts. That's what Ring of Honor in a lot of cases was a combination pro wrestling MMA style type of combat. But I don't think everybody ought to be tapping out or passing out and everybody ought to be putting on submissions. I think that ought to be reserved for the people with the, the extensive amateur backgrounds or an, a possibly a former MMA fighter, or someone whose gimmick lends itself to something like that, because then it's more special, and then you also don't have guys tapping out constantly, because, again, until 10, 15 years ago, go to any locker room in the wrestling business anywhere in this country, and tell... If there's eight baby faces in that locker room, tell all eight of them, I want y'all to tap out tonight and see how many get in their car and drive off. A baby face only gave up when there was no other resort 
And most of the time he'd pass out in the hold rather than give up. And it registered and it meant something. And you remembered it because it wasn't five matches on the same show where the same thing happened. <sighs> All right. Well, Jim, Go ahead. our next question sent to Courtney drive through at gmail.com from anonymous. Was Jim at the TNA show where they set the roof on fire? During- <laughs> <laughs> Hold on, I gotta- <laughs> Sometimes you read a sentence and it just breaks you. Yep. Yep. Was Jim at the TNA show? where they set the roof on fire during a live pay-per-view. Yep. Delaying the show around 30 minutes. Yep. I'm pretty sure it was in August 2006. Yep. Does Jim remember his reaction and the general reaction of the company? Yep. It came across a lot smoother on TV than you'd expect. It sure, but it wasn't smooth in person. Yes. The fucking pyro that they shot off for one of the entrances or whatever started a goddamn fire on something hanging from the rafters in the soundstage that they were using as the impact zone. And it set off, not only set off the alarms, but due to Universal Studios regulations, they had to take it, put all the fans out in the parking lot. They had to evacuate the fans. And I mean, this wasn't like the Chicago fire where you know, the the fire engines were coming in and, and the flames were leaping and people were jumping out of high windows. It was a god it was more smoke than anything, but it was something on fire, and they had to do their whole protocol and it stopped the actual pay-per-view for like half an hour. I can't even remember what they covered with on the air. Um but also the thing is it, we couldn't just pick up where we left off and do the same shit because we had a pay-per-view window on satellite. Still had to be over at the same time as we were supposed to be. So they, we were back there trimming some things, cutting whatever the fuck. But yeah, it took about a half an hour to get that cleared out, put out, all clear, fans back in, here we go again. And I'm back there going, what the fuck? Right? Because the only reason they had the pyro was because they had to look like the WWF. It was ridiculous. That's why I've got tinnitus. I'm sure everybody else did too. That's right after you got there, right? You had just started a few months yes. before that. And I always hated the WWF pay-per-view, but at least we're a pay-per-view, pyro, but at least we were in big buildings. But in that soundstage at Universal that sat a thousand people if you tried real hard, and it, it, there was no place you could go to get away from it, and usually they'd have me out at the start of the program. So I would be ducked down at ringside covering my ears while they shot the pyro off and then I'd have to step right in the ring but it was loud in a small enclosed space they didn't fucking need it it was an unnecessary expense I hated it ruined your hearing didn't add anything to the fucking program it was just because they had to shoot pyro off because that's what Vince was doing pyro in a fucking broom closet so yeah that's I was there and that's what happened Fucking stupid. What would you say beyond like hiring people in terms of incidents like this? What was the stupidest, the most ridiculous, the thing you're like, I can't believe this happened. What was the most TNA moment you had in TNA? Oh, good Lord. Um, I mean, you know, there was the, <sighs> which, in which genre do you want the stupidity uh, creatively, business-wise, whatever. The stupidest thing that I ever saw them do on a creative basis was when Shitstain actually thought he was going to make a star out of Shark Boy imitating Steve Austin, and then they hit him in the head, and he had the amnesia or whatever, and they actually spent money and had people at, at Universal build a set of Shark Boy's supposed home where they could go to his bedside when he was injured and he'd come out of it and think he was Steve Austin. It was the inside of a fishbowl. The walls painted fucking blue like water with fish swimming in it and the, 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 the little castles and things. They built the inside of a fishbowl for this fucking guy. And I liked the guy under the mask. The gimmick was fucking ridiculous and Shitstain took it and ran with it to the point where I was so embarrassed that 
WWF had Steve Austin, and we've got a guy from Cincinnati in a shark mask acting like Steve Austin. That was embarrassing on, or the creative point, the most TNA thing ever. I still, I've saved the format all these years. When And Mike Tanay actually had to read this in a production meeting. When Stevie Richards was supposed to be a psychiatrist, they built him an office <laughs> so Abyss could go and get analyzed by him. And he supposedly fed Abyss a cup of coffee or tea or whatever with a secret drug in it that immobilized him. He couldn't move a muscle. He was conscious and he could understand what was going on, but he was unable to move or speak when Stevie Richards told him that he was betraying him. And he's, ah, I can see the, and on the format, it was actually left blank. I can see the blank is starting to take effect like there really was some kind of fucking curare poison like this in the jungles of the Amazon that would work like this fucking idiot lunatic Russo had written down. But he couldn't even be bothered to get on the internet and look up the name of the poison, so he just left it blank. Like, we'll fill that in later. One of the many poisons that you can slip into coffee that renders you unable to move, but still <laughs> completely. So, I mean, that that stuff happened all the time. And then, you know, and then there, there'd be the, the, the office fuck ups or whatever. When, when I promoted the, the show in uh, Louisville here, one of the first house shows that they ran, we did 3000 people that was for a long time. That was their biggest house show that they had run. We had to set our own ticket account up because they supposedly had a ticket master account, but we couldn't get the information. We had to get the tickets on sale. So we set our own up and then they got mad at us for going to extra expense to setting up a ticket master account that they couldn't give us the information on their own so that we could get the tickets on sale. <laughs> the, the, the office staff was complete bumble fucks or sometimes well-meaning people with no experience. Um, you know, I would get like, I was trying to buy commercials up here with the local cable system and put some things on the local broadcast TVs. And the person in the office that I was supposed to talk to about advertising was some girl that sounded like she was 12 because Dixie would get all these people that had just gotten out of school and would work for little to no money or intern for the thrill of being around this media company in Nashville. And none of them had a fucking clue whether to wind their ass or scratch their watch. So it was a, and me, me and Dennis Condry, because Jeff had talked to Dennis Condry at one time about maybe helping set up a developmental program. Dennis was in Huntsville, 90 miles from Nashville. Me and Dennis both went and talked to, I can't remember the guy's name. He was one of the big wigs that Dixie had hired to run the business end. And he spent, the entire time while we were trying to tell him how to run a wrestling school and run spot shows and training shows like I had done in OVW and like we had experience doing, he was trying to tell us that he could identify with what we were talking about because he had a, an extensive theater and stage background. So he'd been a performer himself. So they're just a bunch of fucking morons, basically. That's why they lost the, the fight, and that's why she lost her company, and that's why now it's a zombie promotion owned by Canadian billionaires that... Boy, a Canadian billionaire, does he still have almost no personality like the rest? <laughs> oh, come on. That's not But anyway... That's not well, nice. You know, what? what's the guy's name? Um, Nordholm, Ed Nordholm. Remember when he... I actually took up for Matt Hardy about five or six years ago when they said they were going to sue Matt Hardy to prevent him from being the broken gimmick anywhere else. I said, well, this fucking idiot starts running a wrestling company, doesn't know anything about it, and he does something stupid like that. So then... They were trying to when, save wrestling. We didn't know. Well, <laughs> when, Jeff, when Jeff Jarrett asked me to come down there and do that fucking run of tapings... He introduced me to Ed Nordholm. He said, here, Jim, here's the stupid son of a bitch you were talking about. <laughs> oh, well, hello, Ed. How are you? Uh, Who knew, yeah. though, that Impact trying to prevent Matt Hardy from using the broken gimmick was actually their way of helping wrestling. And they uh, lost the battle. They who could have? Yeah, but they lost the battle. They lost. She lost her company. They don't know what to do with it. 
And there you go. So T and A, but 20 years, I've, it, it, that's got to be a record for, they have to have the record for money lost in, in promoting wrestling. Because WCW lost $60 million that one year, but they were out of business a year and a half later. I, I had been told when I was there in 2006, seven ish around 2007 or 2008, they had just started to turn a profit for the first time. That was uh, obviously before they brought in all the huge names and, and she went crazy. But when they had gotten angle and they had gotten the two hours on spike TV on what was it? Thursday nights. And they had that, crew that they had around 2007 they had just started to break even and make a little money and at that point i heard that her folks had spent 30 or 40 million and in five years you can see how that might have happened um but then after that they started signing all those names and even when they got spiked to start kicking in on paying some of them like sting or whatever they never they started losing money again and it just got and then they signed Hogan and Bischoff and that's when it got completely out of control and there was no way that she could ever make the money back and that's when her parents had to cut her off and then they limped on a few more years on Rob and Peter to pay Paul and promising and things and then she a lot of people think that she sold Anthem the company she didn't sell them shit she owed them so much money they just switched places they took over the majority ownership and she still had a little minority piece but it was automatic she couldn't pay them so they pulled the contract stat uh, stipulation and took it see that's where it gets interesting because if her family has the money then i presume they have when you say she couldn't pay it her dad wouldn't pay it no they cut her off they could have paid it they, they could have paid it off. like that they wouldn't pay it well no I said she couldn't pay it. Yeah. They could have paid they could have paid it like they paid for fucking parking. She couldn't pay it because she was cut off because she had gone so far down the rabbit hole they said no more. But at at one point with with Dutch Mantel and Jeff Jarrett in charge of the creative team even with Shitstain who they could minimalize and and I I blame Jeff for a lot I never blamed Dutch I knew he wasn't for it but I'd blame Jeff for a long time because I thought that he was calling more of the shots than he was calling so I blamed him for Shitstain being there once I found out that it was her and that he had to live with it and couldn't do anything about it then that took a lot of the heat off of him for me well well he brought Shitstain um, in there by lying to his dad about the whole thing well but then he found out and he got him out and then she brought him back. Uh, but, you know, but once, once, even though the point is when Jeff and Dutch were in charge of creative and they could keep an eye on shit stain and they hadn't overspent for talent and they got the two hour block on Spike, that's when they were in the best position business wise that they ever were. They actually were making a little bit of money for a brief period of time. But then here comes. You know, Jeff gets sideways with her. She sends him home. She fires his guys. She relies more on shit stain. Then she does the deal with Hogan and Bischoff. And the first thing they do is minimalize shit stain. But now they're bringing in every one of their friends. It comes with a high price tag. And before you knew it, she was up shit Creek without a paddle and had no possible way of ever catching up. And that's why they bluffed it for a few years. But finally, there was no other. You know, there was no other solution. They, his, her parents wouldn't give her any more money, and she couldn't pay anything off, and she lost the company. And then it's trotted on since then. But that was my point. Has there ever been a company in wrestling that cumulatively, cumulatively has lost more money than the various incarnations of TNA wrestling, and yet it's still here? And companies that have had hot runs including WCW that had a six-figure million dollars gross one year, are all gone. And that thing's still around has never had a pot to piss in or a window to throw it out of. Well, perhaps some of us have seen TNA. <laughs> and we're looking for a transition. Let me do this for you. 
<laughs> have you been left without a pot to piss in or went to throw it out of because That's of a better. bad luck incident that's happened because somebody has has harmed you, injured you, cheated you, misrepresented things to you, poisoned you, or in some other way damaged your quality of life and now you do not have a pot to piss in or a window to throw it out of. Well, I guarantee you that I know a man that you can call where you can fill that pot up with piss. You can have a nice big picture window and you can throw that pot of piss straight out that window and hit some other sorry son of a bitch in the face with it because that is what's going to happen when you hire this man. Stephen P. News. If you need to see an outlaw mud show or two, still to the rest. Yes, folks, if you've been cheated, hoodwinked, flim-flammed, bamboozled, or had the wool pull it over your eyes by some sorry cretin, now is your chance to get even in a court of law with the law offices of Stephen P. New, newlawoffice.com, 888-692-8084. Folks, you can stand and watch while Stephen P. New fills up a big pot full of piss. Good old yella loud smelling piss and he opens up that window of the courtroom and he throws that plate full of piss right into the people's faces that have harmed you and he makes them apologize to you and pay you money yes no longer will that you be pissless how it works. that's not exactly how it works but he yes, will defend you he will do he will yes he will he will he will not defend you because you've done done nothing wrong he will represent you the other people need somebody to defend them because they're in the wrong. And he will fill that pot of piss up and hand it to you and let you throw it right in their face. And then they got to apologize to you and pay you money. I don't know which one would be better, getting to throw a pot full of piss in somebody's face or having them apologize afterwards and pay you money. But Stephen P. New will fix that up. 888-692-8084, newlawoffice.com. Don't just sit around like a plate full of piss. Call Stephen P. New. He will have you peeing freely on the perpetrator. Why are you focusing on urine all of a sudden? Where did this come from? That was the transition. I don't know. You could transition away from it at some point. All right, we got windows. What can we do with the windows? <laughs> <laughs> all right. If you want a window into your future, ladies and gentlemen, That's you'll right. be living on Easy Street. And you'll be lighting cigars with $100 bills after Stephen P. New gets you the compensation that you so desperately deserve, whether you need to pee or not. That's right. Well, let's uh, get a few more questions in <laughs> after that memorable spot. Jim, this next question was sent to QuinnyDriveThrough at gmail.com from Jeff in upstate New York. Mm -hmm. You have a problem with Jeff? Mm-hmm. Upstate New York. Oh, okay. All right. Caller is the caller there. Would the horsemen have formed without the departure of Buddy Landell? From an outsider's perspective and hindsight, it seems like Landell's departure was a catalyst for the formation of the original horsemen. Mm -hmm. I'd love to hear your insider's perspective. Well, in, in a way, it was very interconnected because, as you will recall, when J.J. Dillon, well, I don't know, maybe not the first guy that he managed. When J.J. entered Crockett Promotions, when Dusty took the book, J.J. had been his assistant in Florida. Dusty brought J.J. up there. He managed, what was Ron Bass and Black Bart as a tag team because he'd managed them in Florida, but he was also his primary singles wrestler was Nature Boy Buddy Landell in 1985. And they had done the Nature Boy program where Flair wrestled Buddy and sold out Raleigh, the biggest house they'd done in Raleigh in fucking years and years at that point. And, you know, J.J. was was not affiliated with Tully had Baby Doll. J.J. was Buddy Landell's manager. Arn and Ole were a tag team, and Flair 
was the NWA world champion, but he was a babyface still in the Carolinas and uh, during a lot of 85, and especially against Nikita Koloff at that Great American Bash that July. So they weren't formed as a heel group and not all the people were in the right place. We've talked about the famous day where Buddy Landell had, had been out late on a Friday night after the show when he'd got to Atlanta and he and Joel Deaton were sharing a room and they get, Joel gets up to go to Atlanta TV that morning, Buddy ain't getting out of bed and Joel shows up and people knew they were together. So where's Buddy? Hey, he's in the room and a bunch of people called Buddy's friends, people, you know, like he's got to be here because that was the day on Atlanta TV. They were shooting some kind of, big angle i can't even remember whether i ever knew the extent of what they were actually going to do that day with buddy and propel him upward but it was a a big deal and that's why we always said buddy you know that was a hundred thousand dollar hangover instead of making six figures the next year being one of the top guys in crockett's hottest year that he ever had in business he grossed 21 million dollars in 1986 Instead, Buddy got fired that day and went back to Memphis. So it cost him $100,000, that hangover. But as a result of that, when they switched things around, that's when J.J. ended up with Tully. And that's uh, shortly thereafter, um, that's when Baby Doll switched Babyface, right? Help me out a little bit on this, the time frame. This is the end of 85, first part of it. It would have been a little bit after that because Baby Doll was still with Tully, obviously, for Starcade 85. So it would have right, been but, shortly, shortly after that. But they, they, they made those moves. Is it Basically, Tully got with JJ, and then they switched Baby Doll away so that then... And the reason why that the Horsemen formed besides that was no grand plan. They were following the... The format that they used to have, especially on Atlanta TV, on a lot of Crockett's TVs, Mid-Atlantic Wrestling, going back into the 70s, at the end of the show, they would have three or four of the top baby faces or three or four of the top heels come out and do a promo about their various issues, just to be, you know, all that star power on the screen, everybody gets a word in, right? And, you know, you've seen some of the clips, there, there would be on the Carolinas TV, there'd be... Rick Flair, Sergeant Slaughter, Roddy Piper at the end with Bob Caudle, right? Doing the heel interview. So they brought out Ole and Arn Anderson, Rick Flair, and Tully Blanchard with JJ, just as the collection of heels that were going to close the show. And that's when Arn did that promo. He looked around, he said, Not since the days of the four horsemen of the apocalypse have four men caused this much chaos, or whatever his exact quote was. And since they were all friends anyway, and they hung out to, except for Ole, obviously, we've well, always said. he was said close Ole. with Flair of anyone. Well, he, he was, he was, he wasn't, a, it wasn't like he wasn't friends with these guys, but he wasn't going out and partying. He wasn't going out with anybody. It was Ole, right? He was the rock. He'll sit in the corner and give advice. But Flair and Tully and Arn and JJ would go out to the bar in Charlotte and go out to the fucking plum crazy and go out the Marriott in Philly or whatever anyway. So it wasn't a stretch for them to be together in a group. And it just kind of happened that way. So it was a, it was a series of events, but actually buddy and his hangover may have, have, uh, may have been the catalyst to make it possible. The other interesting thing too, is Billy Jack Haynes leaving at the end of 85. Because he was being set up. I mean, that was right when they were doing the TV title tournament. What do you remember about Billy Jack leaving Crockett? Well, again, he had been, we'd worked with Billy Jack in Dallas earlier that year when he came in, what, like in March or April-ish for that short period of time where Carrie was supposed to be doing the movie and then he didn't get the movie and they didn't need another baby face. And Billy Jack went back to Oregon. And then we're there in the Carolinas and I'm at, interviews one day and at Crockett's office in Charlotte and in comes Billy Jack. Hey, Billy. And how, and of course he had the, the hat on and he was as hard as this table that I'm leaning on right now. He had 1% body fat at 275 pounds and the absolute limpest handshake ever. He wouldn't put anything into it at all because he, I, you know, 
I, I know he's a strange duck back. He was a very nice guy back then and very soft spoken, but everybody always said that he went out of his way not to have a confrontation with anybody because he'd had the deal where he apparently got a fight with some guy and hit him hard enough. It may have killed him. I can't, I don't want to ascribe a justifiable homicide or any other kind of homicide to anybody, but didn't he kill a guy in a fight because he hit him so fucking hard? That was the story. Yeah. Okay. So the point is he ain't going to squeeze your hand. He's not going to raise his voice. He stays away from confrontations and everybody liked it that way. But he was a nice guy and a good worker. And I've seen the the videos that he's done of recent years, and that was not the, the you know, he was a big, tall, good-looking, nice, soft, but well-spoken, friendly baby face that you didn't think was like a crazy person. And now you see these videos, and obviously something has gone wrong. But he wasn't like that then. Um but he was only, he was there, I can't even remember why he left that time, but he was there, what, two months? And then he leaves, the, he never stayed anywhere besides Portland for any length of time for whatever reason. Oh, the best is still 84 WWF where they did promo packages, building yeah. him up. They put him on the front cover of their magazine in a cartoon with Hulk Hogan and Wendy Richter, and then he just never came. <laughs> in, in a year and a half, he worked for the NWA of... Portland, Florida, world class, Florida was advertised for the WWF, but never actually made it. And, and that, and not by their decision, but by his. And then he made it in 86. And it, yeah, he finally got there. And, and how long was he there? Uh, two years, two years. Did he make it to you? Holy shit. Yeah. But yeah, it was, it was odd, but he, he never stayed anywhere very long. And then I, as I said, I'm, I'm at a loss to explain what's, happened to him since then and we've seen those videos in recent years i don't have any idea on the topic of the horseman you know there's always been that search for the promo no one can find the promo because it's always been said it was a local promo no one can find the promo no. where it says it no it was it was it was on atlanta tv i remember seeing it when they did it i thought it was on atlanta tv at, at the end of one of the shows there is one from atlanta tv and that's the first mention i ever saw four horsemen but i believe and i could be wrong i believe it came from arn and maybe even flair where there was an insistence it was during a local promo that it was said well that's because they i don't want to knock anybody but none of these guys can remember their shit and it's not a knock it's because if, imagine if you did the same thing or something similar every day for 30 years, if you had been to cities where things happened, but you had been to them dozens and dozens of times, would you be able to pinpoint, oh, that was the time that such and such happened? I know I do that. Part of it is I'm a freak of nature. Part of it is I was the manager. I recorded dates and places and facts and things. Part of it was I never went out and got drunk after the matches with all these guys. So I probably remember the things that they did better than they do 30 years later. But uh, you would find when I've tried to ask, you know, and delve into uh, with a great booking mind like Jerry Jarrett or Bill Watts or you know, a guy really like Lawler or even Flair or anybody who I've liked their career. I said, well, what did you do this or do that? Or what'd you think? Or why did this come up? They don't fucking remember. They don't, if they remember doing it, they don't get the facts right. If they get the facts right, it's in the wrong place. And it's not their fault because for a lot of guys also, especially back in those days, the, it was... It was always going to be this way. You never looked backward. You always looked forward because what was done was done. It was no home video. TVs were never to be seen again. And you just kept doing that over and over. So even people that were involved in shit that we all remember, because another thing, I was probably a bigger fan when I got into the business than most guys were that got in as wrestlers. So I already, I already knew more facts and figures when I got into the business as a performer about other people in the business than almost anybody else in the business did. If that makes any sense. I didn't know what I was doing, but I could tell these people what everybody else had fucking done for the previous 15 fucking years. 
So uh, that's why I remember a few more things and or have a little bit more insight on things because, and there's, I've also been a very visual learner all my life. And the reason why I can remember these dates and places is because I either look at my book or I look at the, I've got a huge collection of newspaper ads from all the territories and all the books like the compilations Mark James has done. When I look at that and I look at those cards and I remember writing them, I remember writing them when I announced them, when I did ring announcing. If I've seen something written down, dates, places, figures, I can remember that as well as having a somewhat better than average knowledge of a lot of wrestlers' backgrounds over the last 50 years. Most of the guys didn't give a shit. So you're... Pretty firm. You think the first interview was the one on TBS. That was the first mention of the four horsemen of the apocalypse with these four men and JJ. I think it was. I mean, I'm not going to, you know, fight Arn or anybody or call them liars or whatever, but I think it was. And I, you know, I, I was at almost every local promo shoot. We did them seven, eight hours every Wednesday from 9 a.m. to fucking 4 p.m. at Crockett's office. And we were all there for local promos. I don't remember that where it was suddenly like, oh, shit, we got to say that again. But I remember the Atlanta one. So uh, who knows? Hey, one last thing on all this, and then we'll wrap things up. So 84 Buddy Landell is one of my favorites. He he one one of the best in-ring heels and promos in the wrestling business at that time. That was his best year. It was before he had made enough money to do coke and got out of shape and his worst instincts took over. He was still hungry and he was in a territory where he knew he could learn. There was a tremendous upside. Mid-South wrestling, he had to produce, but he in the ring, he was better than he ever would be again. Did he need a Bill Watts type boss to keep him in line? Yes. I think he, actually, I think he did. If, if he'd have stayed there in Louisiana, instead of going to work for Crockett, he probably would have had a few more really productive years in the business than what he did because, I mean, everybody's seen Buddy work in different places after that early 86 thing, but he was never that prominent or used in that big a position or made that much money again. It was always, well, yeah, we'll take you in Memphis because, God, buddy, you can work and talk. And I used him in Smoky Mountain because he was local and he's a hometown guy and he could work and talk. And he got, you know, underneath positions in WCW, et cetera. But in 84, he was in 83, he, he got incredible shape in Memphis. He and, he and Dennis Condry were working out together because Dennis got a pretty good upper body at that point. And then in 84, like I said, his work was so good and he was in great shape. And then, of course, you know, that's where the downhill slide started because he was making more money than he'd ever made. And I mean, you know, Buddy had $2,000 weeks being in the middle of the cards in Mid-South because we were doing such good business. And that's where he started riding with Pee, Pee Wee Anderson. And that's where, you know, he and Dog started getting together at the hotel. Yeah. You know, they couldn't go out in public together because of heel and baby face, but they'd get together at the hotel. Buddy had worked there as a rookie in Mid-South several years before that and knew everybody, and he'd met Dog. And so, unfortunately, all the people that got those same interests started gravitating together, and they had the money to to spend. and. By the end of by the end of the year, Buddy was still in good shape, but he was starting to get a little less reliable. And he'd already, you know, he was a horrible driver anyway, and a distracted driver, and he wrecked both of his cars that year. And then by the time that Crockett picked him up and brought him in, and remember JJ, they did the smooth operator video yeah, that aired on TBS right. when Crockett had taken over TBS and the big push was the the new nature boy and there was going to be a, the, you know, showdowns with flair. But by the time that, you know, he was on the shit and then after he got fired, he went back to Memphis. He got fat. He got out of shape. He wouldn't, wasn't necessarily lazy. It's just, he just did what he could did to get by because 
he what he wasn't he wasn't he'd had a taste of the big money so when he wasn't getting paid big money he wasn't going to do big money work but nobody was going to give him big money anymore because he was too unreliable if you look so, at him at the end of 85 and then look at him in you know when he made his return to the uwf after he left memphis and after he left crockett again they gave him another shot in 86 when he came back with dundee yeah it was like he stopped going to the gym altogether yeah and i mean by the time and and he was he was thick around the middle when i was using him in smoky mountain wrestling but in between that last run in 1995 that he had there and 1990 or 91 he had gotten positively large and then he he dropped a lot of weight to do that last run in smoky mountain and then he he was in Philly. He, I had him booked in the Royal Rumble. He was finally going to get a shot. I didn't think it at that point. It might have lasted a while because he was back on his good behavior then, and that's why I stuck my neck out. And he was going to be booked in the Royal. He was booked in the Royal Rumble, and he goes to Philadelphia for one of the TVs that we WWF TVs we did to promote it. And he's going into the goddamn hotel in Philly, and it had snowed, and there was ice, and for whatever reason, the automatic door opened out. And he's carrying his bags into the hotel and he slips on the ice and the doors open at the same time. And when he, f he does a baseball slide into the door and the door opens on his knee and tears his ACL. And there you go. And that was the pretty much the last big time spot that Buddy Landell had in his career. Do you remember the first time you saw him do the corkscrew elbow? Yes, it was in Memphis. Um, I mean, his work was impeccable in that elbow, and it was stiff, too. You knew it landed. But he, uh, you know, in 83 in Memphis, he really started working out and getting the upper body and really started turning it on, and the kicks, and the he could throw a forearm that looked like it knocked your fucking head off. Work-wise, he still had that Knoxville accent. I don't know if they would have bought him as the NWA champion, but the way he was working in 1984... If it had been another personality and you just said, okay, I'm going to evaluate this guy's promo ability, his athletic ability, and his working ability, this guy could be in the conversation in five years. That's how good he was. Once you told somebody it's Buddy Landell, immediately that conversation stopped because <laughs> they knew he was, it, it, no, not the person was not going to be able to fucking do that. And I like Buddy. I got to know Buddy, and I like Buddy I did, too. Yeah. I know you did, obviously, but do you think Buddy would have fit in if things had worked out a little differently and Watts did to him what he did to you? Would Buddy have fit into world class in 85? Oh, boy. He was, uh, he was better than – Buddy Landell at that point in time was a better worker than Gino Hernandez or Chris Adams, either one. And I think he was a better promo um, for having in-ring matches. I'm not talking about for being a stooge for the Von Erichs, but for he was better than Gino or Chris, either one in the ring and on promos. They had the, the gimmick and the suits and everything, but Buddy was fucking... He, but I believe with the temptations and the things that were available in Dallas, Texas in 1985, if Buddy had gone to Dallas, he might have died. Um... So, I mean, as far as fitting in, I don't know, would he have put up with working with some of the Von Erichs and some of their Piccadillos? <laughs> I, I keep thinking back to those matches he had with Sonny King where he didn't put up with it. Um, <laughs> I mean, there was... Uh, you want to know how good Buddy was as a worker in 84? Go watch him and Sonny King. Yeah. I don't know if he'd have done well in Dallas because there was no baby face on the other side of the ring that would really have been a good match for him. Uh, he, The Von Erichs did not work a normal style, but he could have got around anything, but he would it wouldn't have been a lot of fun. He wouldn't have been working with the Fantastics because that was our spot and they were a tag team. It, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, he it would have been all right, but nothing nothing to write home about and you asked that's why with watts as a boss and remember watts has told a story and i was there and saw the, some of the check receipts buddy was fined so much at one time for being late for dressing unprofessionally for doing something acid off whatever that watts couldn't take all of the fines out of just one of his checks 
or he'd leave him with nothing. So he was paying installments on his fines. Every every two weeks when he got his check, Watts would take out X amount of dollars as installments on the fines, trying to teach him something. But then as Bill said, and I believe it, because he had that little bonus gimmick going on, he would find Buddy, but later on when Buddy did something good, he'd bonus him back. He didn't get all back because he had to teach a, a lesson of some kind. He got taught a lesson, but he didn't he didn't find him all the money that he really find him because he'd bonus him some back later on. But you would you would see that every once in a while on your check from Watts. You would see the payoffs and it, it would be plus 100 or plus 150 or plus whatever the fuck. For some reason, if he thought either it's a top guy and I booked him in a shitty town, I'm going to take care of him, or he went over and above, or he put in extra time, or just I like the way the kid's coming along, you just see a bonus pop up every once in a while. But that you had Grizzly Smith to keep an eye on Buddy. You had Watts to cut a promo on him when he got out of line. And you had a, some of his friends, but people he respected in the locker room so he didn't go too far afield, and he was still hungry and still wanting to make the big money. That's why his his most formative years were in that environment. And it, and on one more thing, and then you can take this wherever you want. Funniest thing I ever saw. We're all at the Irish McNeil Boys Club in Shreveport, right, for a TV taping, Mid-South Wrestling. And Watts has given one of his pre-show speeches, and he's like, and let me tell you this, I'm sick and tired seeing all of you assholes Throwing these shitty kicks. If you're going to kick a guy, kick him in a safe place and lay it in. Right? Just like this. Buddy had just bought with one of his big checks. Because, I mean, he was making $350 a week in Tennessee, and he comes to Louisiana, and now he's $2,000 some weeks, whatever the fuck. So he's going to spend some money, right? And it was a big deal back in those days to get one of those Halliburton suitcases. The, the shiny silver or gold metallic suitcases that were like the, it's like the Louis Vuitton of the day, but they were indestructible. They were hard sided, made out of metal. They locked great traveling bags. You carry valuables in them, whatever. All the boys, when they made money, that was one of their status symbol things. They'd get a Halliburton. Buddy got him a Halliburton. And Watts is talking about these shitty, phony-looking kicks being thrown. He says, just like this, he pulls Buddy's Halliburton out and sets it in the middle of the floor, and I'm sitting cross-legged in the floor, and all the guys are on chairs in this little tiny locker room. And Watts says, when you lay a kick in like this, use the flat of your foot and lay it in like this. And he fucking flat-footed kicked that Halliburton all the way across the room. <laughs> <laughs> if you'd have kicked a motherfucker in the head like this, you'd have given him brain damage, right? Boom, that's the way you throw a kick. And he goes over and gets it, Watts does, and he sets it back up. He said, now I said, he's going to show him again. Again now. You measure back, you make sure people can see, <laughs> and you throw it, he kicks that thing with the flat of his foot, and it flies across the floor again, sh scraping across the floor. And I, if I'm lying, I'm flying, and my feet have not left the ground. Watts goes and gets it one more time. And he's, he sets it down, and he says, now I reiterate. And just then... Buddy jumped up from his fucking folding chair, got down on his hands and knees over the top of the Halliburton and said, no, Bill, use my head this time. <laughs> <laughs> but that was the way Watts wanted you to kick, by God. Because nobody was going to see through that shit. Hey, one last thing, and then we'll wrap things up. I've never believed it, and I heard it directly from Buddy, and I still don't believe it. Okay. Was Buddy going to be the NWA champion? No. No. If that program with flair it they didn't they didn't do it everywhere and even though they sold out in raleigh there weren't a t they only wrestled singles two or three times right as i can remember that was right yeah. before right before and right as we were coming into crockett's territory i think at the time i don't know this to be true i don't i don't know it to be false i don't know it because i would but i would surmise that when they drew a house like that and they had made that build to not continue with those matches, either there was something that Rick either didn't like about the matches or something that Dusty didn't like about what Buddy was doing outside the ring, or they would have made a bigger deal of that because it started off so they were leading in that direction and it, and it did do business and get interest, but it was, it was cut off and downplayed 
Maybe it was because Dusty knew that he wanted to to make Flair a full-fledged heel so that he could, you know, that Starcade match that year. That may be it. But they were still trying to do something with Buddy as I cuz that the hangover happened afterwards, but it, he was not no, I mean somebody I can entirely believe that somebody said to him at that time, "Buddy, you can be at at some day." or you're good enough, or you might be, or they, they might talk about it or whatever, but nobody went to Buddy Landell and said, you're going to be the NWA world champion, and then they just didn't do it. That, that didn't usually happen in those days, even if, if it was a guy that you could trust as a person to, to carry it. You didn't just go around, they didn't go around saying, you're going to be the champion next week, and then you're going to be the champion in February, and blah, blah, blah. It was a little more difficult than that. All right, and with that, we've done enough. <laughs> we've done enough damage. If you have no more questions, you're free to go. The drive through is closed. What do you get when you cross an elephant with a rhino? He wrote here, Dan Rhino, in parentheses, no relation to Elefino. <laughs> Elefino. There you go. All right. All right. Okay, I'm feeling mellow now. Let's wrap this thing up. <laughs> that song put me to sleep. Uh, of course, well, it's going to be better from here. Well, no guarantees, but of course, the Jim Cornette experience this weekend, wherever you find your favorite podcast, and back next week, here on the drive through on one of these days of the week, wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Of course, you can get access to classic episodes of The drive Through and The Experience by becoming a patron. Patreon.com slash Cornette. For only $5 a month, you get access to the archive going back to the very beginning in 2013. Patreon.com slash Cornette. Of course, subscribe to the official Jim Cornette YouTube channel. Just go to YouTube and search for Jim Cornette. It'll be the very first thing that pops up. Full episodes, clips of episodes, and omnibus collections with the exclusive Travis Heckle artwork. And of course, the many guest artists, the official Jim Cornette YouTube channel. Have you ever almost fallen asleep in the middle of the end of the show? That's what's happening here. Of course, you can follow Jim on Twitter at the Jim Cornette. You can follow me on Twitter at Great Brian Last. You can hear me on the 605 Super Podcast, The Mothership! Huh? Huh? That woke me up. Huh? At 605pod.com, available wherever uh. you find your favorite podcast. I just blew up my voice. God damn it. Um, I plug other things. Cornet's Collectibles at jimcornet.com. There's an auction this week, ladies and gentlemen. The drive through is brought to you by the law office of Stephen P. New. 888-692-8084. Get even with Stephen. Office.com. This is so stupid. Until next week on the drive-thru and on someday on the experience. That was someday, not Sunday. For Jim Cornette, I'm the great Brian Last. Tally ho! <laughs>